Reverend Dr. Ebe Damina. Glory! Glory! Somebody shout hallelujah. Are we excited this morning? Wow, what a time of prayer we had this morning, man. I tell you. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to come before your precious holy written word. Thank you for this time of fellowship, this time of, 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 of communion, and this time of edification that we're receiving from your word. And thank you for the fellowship that we're having with one another in the light. We walk in the light even as you are in the light. So the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanseth us from all unrighteousness. And we thank you that this morning, whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. But in St. Yokes are destroyed. Your people are built up, equipped, edified, and Jesus is glorified. Thank you for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our faith together. As we say these words this morning, I believe the word of God. It is final authority in my life. In spite of my circumstances, in spite of my situation, I believe the word of God. I am what God says I am. I have what God says I have. I can do what God says I can do. I receive revelation. I receive understanding. And I declare that my mind is set to unlearn, to relearn, and to learn. And I declare that by the end of this session, I will never be the same again. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus' name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Glory to God. Help me walk around two, three people, shake somebody, make somebody happy this morning. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Whoa, I tell you, man, I tell you. Uh -uh. That's why we came to fellowship with one another. To rejoice with one another. To celebrate with one another. To behold the wondrous things that God is doing among us. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Amen. All right, grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self this morning as we get into the word of his grace. Uh -uh. So yesterday, we began to say that one of the reasons God can be so easily discredited is because people don't know him by his word. People don't know him by his word. People assume, people know him by rumor, they know him by hearsay, they know God based on their experiences, but they do not know him by his word. So people create their understanding of the nature and character of God based only on the Old Testament. And usually, they don't end up with a full and accurate picture. Because the Old Testament is a partial revelation or a progressive revelation of God. Therefore, we have said time and time again that the Old Testament must be explained. The Old Testament must be explained. Now, of course, for the purpose of reference, the Old Testament will refer to Genesis to Malachi. The Old Testament. And uh, just for the purpose of this session, the New Testament will be Matthew to Revelation. But you know the technicalities, technicalities around because I've taught that over and over. Now we also took time to look at the fact that Jesus must reveal the Father to you. You can't know the Father. Any attempt to try to know the Father will end you in a religion. You can't discover God. Nobody can discover God. All the divergent religions all over the world today came into being because of men's attempt to discover God. Nobody can discover God. Only God can reveal himself. If God doesn't reveal himself to you, you can never know him. All right? So God is a revelation. And the revelation of God can be found in the person of the Christ. So Christ is the revelation 
of God. Christ is the embodiment of God's revelation. No one can come to the Father, Jesus said in John chapter 14 verse 6, but by me. So Jesus is the exclusive access to understanding the Father. Jesus reveals the Father to us. Yesterday we also took time to say you must have a precise revelation of God. Because a distorted revelation of God or a distorted picture or image or understanding of God will give you a distorted relationship with God. So therefore, if your revelation of God is distorted, your worship of God cannot be right. If your revelation of God is distorted, your worship of God cannot be right. Because your worship of God is going to be a product of your understanding of who he is. For he that cometh to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So it's critical to know that you must have such an accurate, a precise knowledge of God. And the precise and exact knowledge of God can only be found in the person of the Christ. The book of Hebrews chapter 1 verse number 3. Hebrews chapter 1 verse number 3. Glory to God. It says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So Jesus is the express image of God. And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus is the brightness of God's glory and he is the express image of God. Jesus is the express image of God. So that means to know God, I've got to know Christ. God is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. The book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15 Brother Paul says to Timothy, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So salvation is faith in Christ. Salvation is faith in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Verse 9, Not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. So salvation is 100% the work of God. By grace you are saved. The grace is the grace of God. Through faith, the faith is the faith of Jesus Christ. So both grace and faith that gets you saved, they are all gifts of God that is communicated through the gospel. So salvation, therefore, will be a product of what Christ has done. It's, go it's not going to be predicated on any human achievement, but established on the fact that it is Christ that has offered us the gift of salvation. In the book of 1 John, chapter 3, verse 19. 1 John, chapter 3, verse number 19. 1 John 3, 19. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. We shall assure our hearts before him. Next verse. Oh, I like this. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Next verse. But beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. Now can somebody say with me, I am of the truth. Now say with me again, I assure my heart. Say it again, I am of the truth. I assure my heart. Now we said, why will your heart condemn you? Because the Bible tells us there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We also saw that because you have passed from death to life, there is no condemnation for you. So if it's clear in the word of God that as a believer, there's no condemnation for you, then why will our hearts condemn us? Now we also took time to say there's been a lot of misinformation on the doctrine of sanctification and the doctrine of, of, of holiness. The way it's been taught in the church. And it has been taught in the church that the cure to sin is sinlessness. Now, the cure to sin is not sinlessness. The cure to sin is righteousness. 
God's cure to sin is righteousness. Which means, therefore, that your understanding of the subject of righteousness becomes fundamental. And let me show you why it is fundamental. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and verse 17. Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. So salvation is going to be a product of the gospel. All right, look at the next verse. For therein, so when the gospel of Christ is preached, the resultant effect of the preaching of the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed. You cannot claim to have had the gospel of Christ and you do not have a revelation of righteousness. If you do not have a revelation of righteousness, you didn't hear the right gospel. If after you are saved, you are still confessing sins and you are still full of guilt and you are not sure whether your sins are forgiven or not, it is a proof that you have not yet heard the true gospel of Christ. Because when you hear the gospel of Christ... Paul says, I'm not ashamed of it because it is the power of God unto salvation. And when the gospel of Christ is preached, there in the gospel will be the revelation of righteousness. So righteousness becomes a fundamental revelation of the Christian faith of all of your relationship with God Almighty. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. So righteousness must be revealed. Now, there are words I asked you to take note of yesterday. The word justify and the word justified. Then the word righteous and the word righteousness. All right? Now, it's important to know that the book of Romans carries the whole of this explanation on the subject of justify, justified, righteous, and righteousness. Now, we said the word justified is dikao in the Greek, D I K A I O. Double O is used in the court when there's a judicial approval of someone or something. That word justified is used in the court of law when there is a judicial approval of someone or something. We said it is used when the judge who is supposed to judge your case takes your side. The minute a charge is brought against you, the judge declares in your favor. Now, when the judge declares in your favor, he is said to have justified you. When he declares in your favor. That means the judge now defends you without defending you. The judge now defends you without defending you. So, the judge by saying you are not guilty has already put up a defense for you. He has come to your aid. So the word justify means to come to another's aid or to approve, to declare someone as upright or as right. That's the word justified. It's used by brother Paul in Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith. So we established yesterday that this justification is going to be as a result of a third party intervention. This justification is going to be as a result of a third party's intervention. We saw these scriptures quickly. The book of Romans chapter 5 verse 9. Romans chapter 5 verse number 9. Romans 5 verse 9. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Justified by his blood justified by his blood. We saw Romans chapter 5 verse 1, therefore being justified by faith. And now we see justified by his blood. That means you were approved because of faith. You were approved of God because of his blood. That's why you were approved of God. I also like the next one. Titus chapter 3 verse number 7. Titus chapter 3 verse number 7. The book of Titus chapter 3 verse number 7. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we're justified by his grace. So the third party there is faith, 
his blood, his grace. A third party. All right. Now Romans chapter 4 verse 4, 25 just gives so quickly. It says, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Glory to God. Now we're going to read Romans chapter 5 verse 17 together. Romans chapter 5 verse number 17. And I want everybody, I want to hear your Holy Ghost voices this morning. Romans chapter 5 verse 17. Let's go. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Say with me, I reign in life by Jesus Christ. Say it again, I reign in life by Jesus Christ. Say with me, I reign over sin, I reign over Satan, and I reign over the kingdom of darkness by Jesus Christ. Glory to God. They that receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, they reign in life. The word gift, there is the word doria in the Greek, D-O-R-I-A. It means it is free and there is no condition attached to it. It is free, no condition attached to it. They that receive the abundance of grace and of the gift. So righteousness is freely given with no conditions attached. That means you don't qualify for righteousness. You don't qualify to be righteous. You don't have to qualify. You don't even need to qualify. So what, what qualifies me to be righteous? Because you are not qualified. Does that make sense? Because you are not qualified. Now, so the word righteousness is used 92 times in the Greek. Is the word daikosune. Daikosune. D-I-K-A-I-O-S-U-N-E. That's the Greek word for righteousness. Daikosune. D-I-K-A-I-O-S-U-N-E. The word justify. Now, notice that word justify. Now, we said yesterday the difference between justify... And righteous, the word daikosuni, it means you are right. You are right. Righteousness means you are right. So daikosuni relates to your state. The state of being right. The state of being right. Then justification, justification is the act that brought you to being right justification or dicoa relates to the act the act that brought you to where you are right which means therefore that the person justifying is now justified he is now called the just or he is now called righteous based on what Jesus has done based on what Jesus has done he now acquires a state. He acquires a state or he acquires a status. Based on what Jesus has done, you have acquired a state or you have acquired a status. In Bible language, the word daikosune is used exclusively for God. Because God is the judge of all. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 verse 23. Please pay attention. Hebrews chapter 12 verse number 23. Hebrews chapter 12 verse number 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven. And to God the judge of all. And to the spirits of just men made perfect. To God the judge of of all. So God is the judge of all. And because he is the judge of all, he is righteous or he has righteousness. That is whatever God says or whatever God does, he is right. We only know what is right by what God says is right because he is the judge of all. 
We only know what is right based on what he says is right. He is the judge of all. So whatever he says, anything God says, and anything God does is right. Amen. Anything God says. If God looks at you right now and says, you are the best of my sons, you are right. Nobody can ever say, oh God, I don't think that thing you said is fair. No, you can't because you don't have the moral right to do that. He's a judge of all. I mean, nobody's above him. He, he reports to nobody. He answers to nobody. Everybody else answers to him. You only know right because he told you this is right. You don't understand? Until the law, sin was in the world, but nobody called it sin until the law came. So they were misbehaving, but it was okay. And nobody called it a sin. Because there was no law. If there are no traffic lights on this express road, you can drive and you can, you can just go without stopping. If there's no speed limit, you can drive at any speed level you want to. But the moment the speed limit and you go beyond, beyond the speed limits, you've broken the law. You will be held accountable. So, but once there is no law, anything goes. There was a time where there was no law. There was a time when there was no law. And everybody did what was right in his own eye. And it was okay. It is the arrival of the law that brought the knowledge of sin. I had not known sin until the law said so. I'm teaching good here. So it is only God that tells us what is right and what is wrong. Otherwise, when we say this is right and it doesn't agree with what God says is right, it's wrong. He's the judge of all. Keep that somewhere because we're going to we're going to play with that in this service. Glory to God. So he's the judge of all. He is righteous or he has righteousness. That is, whatever he says or does is right. Whatever he says or does, he is right. Because we only know what is right from what he says is right. And what is not right from what he says is not right. So he is called the judge of all. Genesis chapter 18 verse 25. We're going to look at a few Old Testament scriptures. Genesis chapter 18 verse number 25. Glory to God. Are you in the building? Yes, sir. I hope you know we don't do this kind of meetings every day in the UK. So enjoy it right now. Enjoy the best of it. Glory to God. It says, That be far from thee to do the after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? This is Abraham interceding or praying for Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's telling God, God, you cannot destroy the righteous and the unrighteous. You are the judge of all the earth and we expect you to do right. He is the judge of all. So we have seen in Hebrews, he's the judge of all. We have seen in Genesis, he's the judge of all the earth. So there's a corroboration between the Old and the New Testament that God is the judge of all. Now, so, God has to be seen to do right. He has to be seen to do right. The word do right is a Hebrew word, mishfat. Mishfat, M-I-S-P-H-A-T. Mishfat. It means to acquit. To acquit. It also means to do justice. Or to do what is proper. To acquit. To do justice. Or to do what is proper. Why did he say that? Because in that Genesis chapter 18 verse 19. Genesis chapter 18 verse 19. 19 in the pretext of the judge of all the earth do right god says for i know him speaking of abraham that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the lord to do justice and judgment god says i know abraham will do justice and judgment that the lord may bring upon abraham 
that which he has spoken of him. God says, I know him. I know Abraham. He will do what is right. I know Abraham to do justice and judgment. Before that period, in Genesis chapter 15, remember this is chapter 18, we find why God said he knows that Abraham will do justice and judgment. What gave God that boldness to speak like that concerning Abraham? Genesis chapter 15 verse 6. Genesis chapter 15 verse number 6. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Abraham believed in the Lord. And his faith in the Lord is credited to his account as righteousness. Abraham believed. He believed the gospel. <laughs> Abraham believed the gospel. The gospel that was preached to him. In blessing, I will bless you. In multiplication, I will multiply you. In you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And Abraham believed. And it was credited to his account as righteousness. Are we teaching here? Now, the word for righteousness is the word sedequa in the Hebrew. T-S-E-D-A-Q-A-H. Sedequa. You know, the New Testament was written from the Old Testament. So you find words that were used in Hebrew translated into the Greek in the Old Testament. So sedequa is the Greek word of mishfat in the Old Testament. So mishfat, which is to do right, to do justice, or to do what is proper, is the same word as daiko, D I A K I double O to justify. The same word is transliterated from the Greek. And you know, when you have a transliteration of the Hebrew into the Greek, it's called the Septuagint Greek. The Septuagint Greek is a translation of the Hebrew text of the Old Testament that has words in the Greek that interprets the same word in Hebrew into the Greek. Because it's a Greek translation of the Old Testament. You don't get that? We all know that Greek is New Testament. Hebrew is Old Testament. But there's a Greek translation of the Hebrew of the Old Testament. Which is called the Septuagint Greek. Alright? That's just for you to have some information. For your personal study. And for your personal spiritual development. Alright? The Septuagint Greek. Now, to know the words that are similar. Is why you use the Septuagint Greek. The word misfat. And the word dekao means to treat as proper. To deal with as right. To treat as proper. To deal with as right. Then there's the word daikosune. is the same word as sedekwa. A state of being proper. A state of being proper. Abraham believed the Lord... And it was credited or accounted to him as righteousness. As righteousness. You know, when you come to an understanding of what I'm teaching right now, you don't recognize the existence of Satan and demons any longer. Somebody like me, I can't remember the last time I said, Oh, Satan, I bind you, I bind you, you cannot come to my house. I can't remember the last time. Honestly, when you hear me call Satan, is when I'm praying for people in church. In my own private life, such things don't exist. There's a level of light you carry where you don't recognize darkness. It's light. It's light. It's light. <clears throat> it's light. Somebody said he was going to charm me. I said, can I give you all my names? Or do you need a piece of my cloth? I can give you a shirt. Charm me. Charm me. Me. Charm me. 
you have never been born. I agree with you. To church, church, church. <laughs> Even the charm is afraid for me to be invited. It's light. It's light. How can I be afraid of Satan when Jesus who lives in me defeated him 2,000 years ago? Now, it's an understanding of righteousness that gives you that audacity. And that's why this subject is so critical and fundamental. It defines everything about your relationship with God. It defines everything about your authority as a believer. That's why they that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall what? Reign. So you cannot reign if that revelation does not illuminate your heart. You'll be operating like a victim in Christianity even though you are designed by, by your DNA to be a victim over demons, over hell, over Satan, over everything that the devil can offer anybody in this life. It is that understanding Jesus had that the devil could not mess around with Jesus. It's not because he was Jesus that the devil could not mess around with him. That's why Jesus who said, the prince of this world came to me and he found nothing in me. Because when you understand righteousness, Satan can never find anything in you. I'm teaching good this morning. Say with me, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Say with me, I have all it takes to reign in life. I didn't hear a powerful amen. amen. Now, stay with me. Why did God say, I know Abraham, that he will do right? Because God himself, who is the only one that is right, has justified him. God himself, who is the only one that is right, who defines for us what is right and what is wrong has already justified Abraham. Remember Genesis 15? Abraham believed God and it was credited to his account as righteousness. So in chapter 18 of Genesis, after Abraham is righteous, God says, I know that you will do right because when a man is righteous, he does right. He does right. It's a state. It's not an event. That becomes your status. Doing right becomes your status. God was not talking about Abraham's conduct when he said he would do right. It had nothing to do with conduct. He was talking about Abraham's faith. Abraham's faith. He will do right. So righteousness, therefore, is the state. The righteousness refers to one who has done rightly. When we say you are righteous, you are one who has done rightly. Go to Romans chapter 3, verse number 24. Romans 3, 24. Being justified freely. If your Bible was mine, I will underline freely. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Notice how brother Paul is going to build his case. Justified how? Freely. So who is going to justify him? God. How is God doing this justification? He is doing this justification without attaching conditions. It is justified freely. Watch the way Paul is building the case. The justification is freely. No conditions. Who is doing the justification? God. For him to be righteous in what he is doing, there must be a legal base. There must be a right reason. Now he says, the reason for this justification is through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Through that redemption. The justification is through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Please don't miss that. The justification is through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now look at verse 25 of that same chapter. 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So, 
Paul is establishing God's conduct as proper. That God didn't justify just acting on his own. In verse 25, he said that God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Through faith in his blood. You don't want to miss that. Through faith in his blood. Look at verse 26. And 26 is a key verse in this context. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness. That he might be just. Oh, glory to God. I can stay here for one month. That he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. That he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. That is, what he has done displays his nature as always doing right. What God has done displays his nature as always doing right. The word daikosune. That is, what God has done is just. That is, you can also justify God by what he has done. Are you following this? That's to say, God did not break protocol. God did not tamper with the process to get at the product. God has subjected himself through the scrutiny of protocol and by, by legality has arrived. So that when you look at what God has done, first of all, God himself is justified. And because he's justified, he now qualifies to be the justifier. I don't know if you're following what I'm saying. There's legality in this operation. That God didn't just say, Adam, you sinned? Okay, don't worry, you're forgiving. Uh-uh, uh-uh. That's not what happened. That's not what happened. God subjected himself through the test of being justified. So that he can be the justifier, look at it, that he might be the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Huh. Now, <clears throat> That is, you can look at God and say, you are not being deceived by being righteous. Yeah, you are not being deceived. You can look at God and say, I know how you made me righteous. Because God, first of all, acquitted himself. He acquitted himself. If God has said, Adam, I know you sin." Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. You can go, don't worry. No. There's no justice there. If God had said, I know you sin, but because I'm God, you can go. No, there's no justice there. You know, many people think when we say your sins are forgiven, God just said, because I'm God, you can go. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, no, 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 at all, at all. And that's why some people are economical in saying I'm righteous. Because in their minds, they think it was just God just said, don't worry, just, just go, just go. And God can change his mind and say, okay, I changed my mind. Don't go, don't go. You must pay for this. You think you can just go like that? You must pay for this. So we just think that, there's no basis. And so when you are saying I'm righteous, you're saying it cautiously. I'm righteous. In case God changes his mind, nobody heard you. <laughs> you know, nobody heard you. They're like, we were casting out demons somewhere, and I told the guys, I said, hey, you guys, cast out those other ones. Let me clear this other side. And then I saw one of them, he stood near the person and said, come out. <laughs> come out. So I said to him, why are you whispering? He said, shout. So I discovered he was scared. He didn't want to say, come out. And everybody is watching and the demon didn't come out. 
Just that shows sin consciousness. And then while he was standing, I just and the person just went, Wah! I said, shut up and out. And then he said to me, how did you do that? I said, because I know who I am. And they know who I am based on who I am. The devil knows if you know who you are. He knows. And if you don't, then he knows that you're not a threat. So he can take you for a ride. Even though the price has been paid, he can take you for a ride because you don't know who you are. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So God didn't just say, you know, I know you sinned, but just go. No, he did it in a way where he might be just. So what is God's justification for justifying you? God's justification for justifying you is that God himself is seen to be just in his actions. God declared a state of being right. How? That he might be just. That is, you can see clearly that what God has done is right. How? On perfect legal ground. On perfect legal grounds. Based on the legality of what he has done. We can see that what he has done is right. And that's why you must know that's why the justification is right. Because if you don't know you will have an impression. That justification is based on how God feels per time. Many of us the problem we have is. We have double minds about God. You know, but this justification and righteousness, God has done this on perfect legal ground. If, you, if you're with me, shout a powerful amen. Now, take this. Righteousness is not forgiveness. Righteousness is not forgiveness. And righteousness is not pardon. Like, don't do it again. Don't do it again. You're pardoned. Righteousness means you have been declared right. You have been declared right. It means you have no wrong. Righteousness means you have no wrong. It's like somebody says, that man is a thief. You ask him, do you have evidence? He said, I don't have evidence, but that man is a thief. You know, that's very dangerous. That's very dangerous grounds to tread on because you can be sued for defamation of character and you will pay dearly for it. You can't just go around accusing people. <laughs> you can't just go around accusing people. That one is a thief. That one is this. You must have evidence. <laughs> You, you must have evidence. If you don't have evidence, you can't go around and just say, that one is a thief, the other one is a... Is, no, no, you don't do that. <laughs> Certain things are not done based on rumor or how you feel. They are done on perfect legal grounds. You must bring your witness against the person. You didn't hear that. You must bring your witness against the person. You can't expect God to be acting on rumor and acting on the basis of how you feel. There are perfect legal grounds and you must bring your evidence against the person. The same way it says that he may be seen to be just. That God may be seen a state of being. That he may be seen to be who he is. How did he do it? He didn't do it because of something the person did. It was a third party action that made him justified. What kind of action? A third party action. All right. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. We're all going to read together. Romans chapter 4, verse number 5. Glory to God. Let's go together, everybody. One to go. But to him that walketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. 
He walked not. He did nothing, but believed on him that justified the word ungodly. If your Bible was mine, I will underline that word ungodly. He justifies the ungodly. The word ungodly, now remember, he's talking about Abraham in this context, right? Because Abraham was an ungodly man before God called him. The word ungodly is a Greek word, asebis. A-S-E-B-E-S. Asebis. A-S-E-B-E-S. Asebis. It's used for criminals. God justifies the criminal. Hmm. Or is used for the wicked. It's used for those that are morally bankrupt. The wicked, criminals, those who are morally bankrupt, as a beast. It's used 29 times between the four gospels and the book of Acts. It's used for those people who crucified Jesus. It's used for very, very wicked people. In fact, the word as a beast is used for those who go to hell. Wicked people. In the Hebrew, is somebody who fails to honor God that is called ungodly. And that was what Abraham was in his conduct. Yet God found a legal way of declaring Abraham the cow, acquitting him perfectly. Abraham is a criminal. He's a wicked person. He's an ungodly man that fails to honor God. But God found a legal way of declaring Abraham right. Uh, yeah. God found a way, and I'm going to show you how, how God found that way of declaring Abraham from being an ungodly man to a righteous man. In fact, if you look at how this is discussed in Romans 4, it says, when you work for something, it is not called grace. It is called a debt. It's not grace. That is, the person you worked for has become your debtor. You are now his creditor. He said, but it's not like that. When it is of grace, it is not a reward for good work. In the minds of many of us, and I grew up like that, I had to unlearn a lot of things. We think having a right standing with God is a reward of persistent church attendance. Very good behavior. Well-behaved people. Now that's a way of thinking and it's a mentality. Some people may have health problems or a lady gets married, she's not getting pregnant. And the man of God will say, sister, come. How many boyfriends did you have before you got married? He's trying to bring sin consciousness as a reason for her not getting pregnant. I don't know if you know those brothers in those churches. If you come and say, I don't know, I, I feel like I'm under attack. How many hours did you pray last night? You're in the flesh. <laughs> They're always too spiritual. Even when they greet you, they greet you in the spirit. They're too spiritual. I don't know if you have seen those kind of people. And most of the times they intimidate everybody. They don't smile. And when they finally smile, it's very brief. Because <laughs> they're too spiritual. Everything, they see spirit in everything. Everything. Back in the days when I got born again newly, if a lady was pretty and beautiful and fair, she was from the river. Water spirit. And we have to do deliverance for her. 
Oh, how many fair sisters had deliverance in our hands. And if you are a sister and you perm your hair, you are mommy water. Then we have to cut off your hair and cast out the spirit. How many sisters' hair did I cut with scissors, baby? God have mercy on me. Baby. <laughs> and please, if you are watching, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, we're going around cutting sister's hair. Come, 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 come. Oh, Jesus. I just saw something. We saw nothing. <laughs> it's intimidation. And sister will be panicking. So I just saw something. There are like four spirits sitting on your head. That is why every time you have four voices talking to you, one will say go, one will say come, one will say don't come, and there's nobody who doesn't have those voices. Psychology without training. <laughs> we did some of these things. I mean, I did some of these things. There was always a reason why, especially if you're somebody that is going through trying times, we say, Yeah, 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 yeah. Your spiritual life is down. Your spiritual life is down. When we say come for fasting, you will not come for fasting. Now look at it. Just look at what is happening to you. You need to come up, brother. You need to come up. <laughs> All of those thrives on the platform of sin consciousness. And the more it happens to you in the church, the more sin conscious you become. The more unsure of yourself, the more, you know, lack of confidence is built on your inside. And all of these were things we were exposed to when we were growing up, you know, growing up in our Christian faith because of the people we looked up to. And that was the kind of things they modeled for us. But God justifies the ungodly. I didn't hear a powerful amen. How did God justify the ungodly? Romans chapter 5 verse 6. Romans chapter 5 verse number 6. He justifies the ungodly. Romans 5 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. When did he justify the ungodly? When we were without strength, in due time, who did Jesus die for? He died for the ungodly. He didn't die for good guys. He didn't die for religious people. He died for real core criminals, rebels, the ungodly. Those are the people he died for. Now, there's no way you can say that the ungodly qualified for it. First of all, they have no regard for God. Secondly, they are rebels. Number three, they are not even thinking of God. Yet, in their, in their waywardness, he died. So, his death was not an answer to prayer. His death was not an answer to a, a request. His death was grace. You don't qualify for it and there's no promise that you will accept what I'm going to offer you but I'm going to go all the way and offer it anyways by faith that you will accept. So, Jesus or God looked for a legal way of justifying the criminal irrespective of the criminal and in spite of the criminal. He justifies the ungodly. He justifies the ungodly. So, on what basis was the Daikosune, the Dikau, the sinner? Because Christ died for the wicked. So, if Christ died for the wicked, you can't hold him again. You cannot hold the wicked again as being wicked. Because, for lack of good English, he has been died for. <laughs> he has been died for. <laughs> Hasn't he been died for? Yeah. Exactly. He has been died for. And if you don't understand that, keep it somewhere. <laughs> You can't hold the criminal as a criminal anymore because he has been died for. 
Yeah. So the criminal will no more be seen as a criminal. The criminal now will be seen in a state of one who is right. As one who is right. I'm going somewhere with this. The wages of sin is confession. Is that in anybody's Bible here? The wages of sin is confess. What is the wages of sin? Death. The penalty for sin is death. The criminal is supposed to die because the criminal is a sinner. But somebody has paid it for him. So you cannot hold him anymore for that crime. The wages of sin, you know, the reason why many churches don't preach this is because they don't talk about Christ's death. That's why they don't preach the kind of things we're preaching here. They don't talk about Christ's death. They talk about Christ's death once a year during Easter. And even that one, the message is not correct. Because they will just tell you the passion of the Christ from Mel Gibson. They go there and draw inspiration. They will watch it all night. And on Sunday morning, they will preach Mel Gibson's message. Which is even anti-Christ. That movie is anti-Christ. Because the movie dealt with everything minus the message. There's no resurrection in that movie. And if there's no resurrection, then the gospel is a fraud. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 14. And I want us to read together like a mask. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 14. Can we all go? Want to go? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. So Mel Gibson shows you everything, including where they beat Jesus, where he fell down, where they booted him, where they kicked him, and where all the blood was gushing out, even though that has nothing to really do with the message of Christ. Because any criminal can be maltreated that way. Any human being can be dealt with that way by any, any government that decides to really manhandle people. So anybody could have received the floggings, the stripes, carry a cross, fall down, stand up, fall down, nail his hands and nail his legs. Anybody could have had that. So all of that is not the message that saves. Because any criminal could have gone through that and even worse. Where the robber meets the road is what movie cannot capture. <laughs> what movie, no movie writer can capture the resurrection. Because the resurrection is not eyewitness. The resurrection is revelation. Because from the moment Jesus died to when he rose, nobody knows what happened. It has to be revealed. I don't know if you understand. You can only know a man to the point where he stops breathing. From the moment he stops breathing, you don't know where he is. You don't know what else is happening. All you're seeing is his body breathless. It will have to be revelation knowledge. Your eyes have to be opened into the realm where he is to see what is happening. Am I teaching here? So, Mel Gibson can write all the things that has to do with what does not affect the, the salvation message. Okay? And he can even imagine it. Create things that make it look real. But the message is missing. Because how do you dramatize resurrection? How do you do that? And, and even if you dr dramatize somebody coming out of a grave, how do you dramatize the events of the three days in hell that are not visible to the human eye? And that is where the four witnesses of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's where they are limited. That's where they are limited. And that is why it will take a brother Paul who was not there. Who was not there. Did not experience the event. Never met Christ. Was not in the picture. And he shows up and takes off from where Jesus died all the events of the three days to the resurrection, to the ascension, to the glorification, and now coming in to live in the believer. That is revelation knowledge. And that is where Christianity is, not in the other ones. All religions in the world love the four gospels. 
Mahatma Gandhi said, I love the four gospels because the four gospels have moral lessons that will make the society great. All religions love Christianity if it's just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the moment the epistles are brought to the picture, that is the game changer. They start fighting because how do you deal with in Christ? In Christ. If any man be in Christ, how do you handle that? It's a brand new species of being that never existed before. Go, read oh God. Where is that new man in this building? Somebody shout, I'm that new man. And that's why the Bible says the world does not know you because he can't know him. He has to be revealed. If it's not revealed, you cannot know him. And if all you know of Jesus is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you are just a religious person. You are just a religious person. You don't even have the revelation of God's life. If that's all you know. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All religions have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in them. But they reject the epistles. They can't handle the epistles. How does the how did the epistles open up? See Romans chapter one verse one. Look at the way, look at the way they open the epistles for us. Romans chapter one verse one. Put up Romans chapter one. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated. He is telling you my credentials. I wasn't among them. I'm in a special class. I'm set apart to bring to you the gospel of God. Look at it. The gospel of God. This is different from the gospel of Christ. The gospel of God. Why did he call it the gospel of God? The next verse will explain why he called it the gospel of God. Which he had promised. So the gospel of God is the promise. Is the promise of, of the resurrection in the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament they had the gospel of God promised by his prophets in the holy scriptures look at the next verse you will love verse 3 concerning so the gospel of god is concerning is that not what jesus said you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life but they are they which testify of me that is the gospel of god concerning his son jesus christ our lord which was made of the seed of david according to the flesh matthew mark luke and john Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Made of the seed. So, brother Paul captured the incarnation because the incarnation is a fragmental part of the gospel. But it doesn't st stop there. In fact, that's just like an introduction. Now he takes it into where the rubber meets the road. Verse 4. And declared. Declared a zegomai. Declared to be the son of God with power. How? According to the spirit of holiness. How? By the resurrection from the dead. So he was not a son until he rose. Jesus was not a son until he rose. Henceforth know we no man after the flesh. For once upon a time we knew Christ after the flesh. Henceforth now know we him no more. So we don't know Jesus of Nazareth. We don't know that baby that came through the womb of Mary. We don't know that one. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Which day? The day of the resurrection. Are we teaching here? We know him by the resurrection. He's declared to be the son of God with power. According to the spirit of holiness. By now, come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 17. Now, we're going to read together. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 17. Glory to God, not Chronicles, brother. Bless your fingers. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 17. He's flowing in the spirit. The thing is shaking his hands. So, the hands are touching buttons anyhow. <laughs> Glory to God. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 17. Can we all go together? Everybody want to go. And if Christ be not raised, 
your faith is vain. You are yet in your sin. So any gospel that does not arrive at the resurrection is a deceptive gospel. That gospel will leave you in your sins. That gospel cannot change you and it cannot empower you. It's vain. It makes our gospel useless. Because Christianity begins and ends with the resurrection. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten you. And again I will be to him a father. And he shall be to me a son. And that is where identification comes. The identification theology comes in there. We were dead in sins. He was also dead. He died in our place. So he too was dead in sins. Identification. And on the third day he rose. And when he rose, he quickened us together. So that's, that's how we became sons. The way he became a son. In the resurrection. The incarnation is useless to us because none of us is incarnated. So there's no identification. But the only way he could identify was first of all to come through the incarnation because he has to be born in a particular way. He has to come to this earth through a woman like everybody does. But that birth is not the crux of the matter. That appearance actually, the epistles doesn't call it a birth, right? It's actually an appearance. Okay. Religion calls it birth. Okay, we allow it to be birth. It's actually, it's actually an appearance. It's a manifestation. God manifested. First Timothy 3.16. Let me give it to you. First Timothy 3.16. Let me give it to you for free. First Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. First Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, without controversy, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was what? Where? So it was not a birth. It was a manifestation. It was an appearance. It wasn't really a birth in the sense of a birth. Theologians call it incarnation. Because there's, it can be called a birth. Because before Mary, he has been. He didn't start with Mary, so it cannot be called a birth. While Mary was holding him, he was the one holding Mary. Before Abraham was, I am. So if he predated Abraham, who is Mary? Are we together? Okay, let me ask a question. Did Jesus start existing with Mary or before? So was he in the Old Testament? Was Jesus in the Old Testament? Yes. Was Jesus in Genesis? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. He was in Genesis. Yes. Okay. So if he was in Genesis, then we can't say Mary gave birth to him because then there cannot be a birth. So that's why it's called an appearance or a manifestation. And theologians, for lack of a good word, they call it incarnation. Incarnation is the best way because you can't say birth, but you can incarnate. God became a man. God became a a man. And the process of becoming a man is to stay in the womb of Mary for nine months. But don't forget the blood of Mary and the DNA of Mary and Joseph did not touch his because they were sinners and he was not a sinner. He only sat in the womb of Mary and just sat there and waited for nine months. And once it was nine months, he walked out. But he had to walk out in a way Satan will know that this is God. Because if Satan knows this is God, Satan will be smart enough to make sure he doesn't die. So he has to come out in a way Satan will think is just an ordinary baby. That's why they tried to kill him and they ran with him to Egypt because they all knew this was an ordinary baby. But they didn't know that behind the ordinary baby was God. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That was who Mary was holding. And even Mary herself didn't fully understand. That's why one day she came to Jesus and said, your father, your father and myself will be looking for you. Why do you behave like this? Jesus, why? And I'm sure she must have done it said like this. Why do you behave like this? You know women, you know women, right? To just make him know that I'm your mama. Why did you do like this? And I'm sure Jesus just looked at her and said, hmm. know you not 
Know you not. A quiet bomb person will say, Ma, know you not. <laughs> Know you know that I must be about my father's. That's say, you, you, you guys are honest. You, you think you're my father. You think you're your mother. Why do they say your mother is waiting for you? You say, Who is my mother? Who is my mother? <laughs> Who is my mother? These ones that do the will of God, they are my mother, my father, my brother, and the parents were standing behind. <laughs> I'm sure he just backed them like this, you know? He backed them like this. These ones, these ones, these ones, these are my mother, my father, my brother, my sister. They do the will of God. <laughs> Jesus must have been a troublemaker, man. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. He, was he, he was very loud. He would just come to people and call them generation of vipers. Whitewash sepulchre. Then he would come to church and drive everybody out, carry all their tables and be throwing away. One man's cord. And everybody will obey him. And that's the person's gospel we are supposed to preach. And he said, We should be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> you want us to be quiet <laughs> when the messenger himself is not quiet <laughs> when the message himself is not a quiet message how can we be quiet glory to God I say glory to God I say glory to God God was what manifest where in the flesh it is the manifested God in the flesh who died and now rose to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection. And now by that resurrection, we all have been raised with him. So today, all that he obtained in his resurrection, we have become beneficiaries of it without our personal qualification. Is it clear? Now, you know where we have a problem is in our minds, we always like to work for something that we believe is legally ours. So we really want to walk, and God is saying, no, in this kingdom, you don't walk. In this kingdom, someone walks, you receive it. And you receive it as legally yours. And you use it unapologetically. Are we teaching here? So Now, if that makes sense to you, it will be easy for you to receive righteousness. It will be easy for you to receive righteousness. And it will be easy for you to function in righteousness. It will be easy for you to defeat condemnation and guilt and it will be easy for you to destroy all those things that the enemy uses to limit, restrict, and make you unsure of yourself. It will take the revelation of these truths. It will take the revelation of these truths. I don't know if I've told the story here, but I know I told it in Nigeria. I don't know if you watched that service. Well, we're having an all-night prayer and I asked some pastors to go cast out some demon from one girl that was making noise in the service. This girl, as soon as I walked into the service and I started leading in a worship, she just started screaming, yeah, 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 and her voice overshadowed all of us even with the microphone. <laughs> it must have been voice of many waters. <laughs> you know, some people have 6,000 demons inside them. So when they say, yeah, you think it's one person, it's 6,000 voices in one. <laughs> So I, I just said, take her out, take her to the other building, take her to the other building, because there's a school we were using. So they took her to the other classroom, and then I told the pastors that used to come for my meeting, and they used to sit in front, because they're the men of God. I said, all of you, go and take care of that girl. <laughs> all of you, go and take care of that girl. So they all moved out to go and take care of the girl, and I'm here leading worship, and we're singing. Oh, Lord, my God. We were just worshiping and having a beautiful time. Then one of my PAs came around the pulpit and he's trying to get my attention. So he says to me, there is trouble. <laughs> <laughs> there is what? He said, there is trouble. <laughs> so I didn't like it. I said, go ahead, keep singing it, keep singing it. What trouble? <laughs> he said, the girl has subdued all of them. <laughs> the girl has subdued all of them. All those men. <laughs> I, said, I said, what did she do? He said, she's stuck naked. <laughs> they ran away and left her in the room. <laughs> so I called the person. I called the worship leader and said, Continue, continue worship. <laughs> so I went to the back to go and see what's happening. They are all outside. 
She's the only one inside. She took over the whole classroom. And she's doing, And all of them are standing outside. Blood of Jesus. <laughs> so when I got there, I said, what are you people doing here? <laughs> he said, uh, we think you have to attend here. <laughs> I said, my friend, go inside and cast out the demon. So as soon as he moved in, the lady just said, uh, even you. Immediately she did even you, he just took steps back up. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure when she said, even you, the devil flashed all his problems. <laughs> sin the devil uses sin consciousness all the time. So I walked in immediately and I said, all of them, watch, watch me. I just walked in and I said, hey, shh, shh, sit down in the name of Jesus. She said, shh. I wasn't afraid of naked. Haven't I seen nakedness before? I said, sit down. I said, get her clothes quickly, put them on her. And you, unclean spirit, out. The demons just left. I said, package her together. I said, can you guys get her filled with the Holy Ghost? They were still scared. I got her filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> she was speaking in tongues by the time I left. I went back to the service. Why? Because I came with righteous consciousness. They came with sin consciousness. And that's what happens when you pray with sin consciousness. Their prayer goes nowhere. It only stays with you. But when you pray with righteous consciousness, Father, I thank you that you hear me always. I am an hatter. Everything clears. All of earth is waiting for the next instruction. Somebody shout, I hear you. Say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Say with me, I am as righteous as Jesus right now. I didn't hear a powerful amen. I wake to righteousness and sin not. So to overcome sin, just be righteous conscious because the cure to sin is not sinlessness. The cure to sin is righteousness. Are we teaching here? See, let me push a little more. So God is manifest in the flesh. God is manifest in the flesh. It is in that manifestation that Jesus took care of the wages of sin. You will see that Christ didn't die for himself. He didn't die because he was caught. He died for the wicked. Jesus died for Pilate. He died for Herod. He died for the Asebis. You remember the Asebis? A-S-E-B-E-S. The criminal, the wicked, the rebel. Those that failed to honor God, the Asebis. So it's on very equitable terms. It's not because God just looked at you and pitied you. Say, ah, ah, because I am God. I pity you. I know you cannot do without sin. Anyway, you are free. No, no. It's on legal, equitable terms that he declared you righteous. Equitable terms. So, Romans chapter 5 verse 8 now tells us how he did it. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God commendeth. God commended his love towards us. In that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet what? Sinners. While we were yet sinners. Look at the words Paul used. While we were yet sinners. The word sinners is a word used for rebels. Rebels. Those who are rebellious. Christ died for rebels. Christ died for criminals. So if you're going to benefit from the death of Christ, you must be a criminal. If you're not a criminal, that death is not for you. You have to be a criminal in the sense of a criminal. And you have to be a rebel for you to benefit. That's why I say I didn't come for the righteous. I came for sinners. I came for rebels. My death will be of no good to people that are already good. My death is for those that have been condemned. Hard criminals. Those are the people I'm dying for. While well, you're yet sinners. He, he died for us. He justifies the ungodly. 
He doesn't justify good guys. He justifies real bad guys. So in case you're sitting here and the devil has been telling you, there are certain things, you know, certain things, you know, certain things. There are certain things in your family. Certain things, you know, in your background. Yeah, certain things. Family patterns and generational causes that are still following you. There are certain things. When you look at your father, it happened to him. You look at your mother, it happened to you. And now it is happening to you. There are certain things. You can't overlook them. <laughs> In case the devil has been talking to you like that, tell him, shut up. There's no certain things anywhere. Old things are passed away. This man does not have a past. This man only has a future. Glory to God. This man is created in Christ Jesus. This man is created in Christ Jesus. Unto good works. There's no past. There's no past. Glory to God. There's no past. So what happened to my father? What happened to my mother? It's not going to happen to me. Because I'm not my father. I'm not my mother. I'm a total new creation. Somebody says, but you, don't you think you need to put an end to the past? How many pasts did Paul put an end to? Somebody who was killing people. Blood in his hand. Blood all over the place. His hand was full of blood. So if there's anybody that needed to break foundations and, and break curses, will be brother Paul. Human blood. He came to the church in, 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 in Corinth. And he said, receive us. Receive us. We have defrauded no man. We have wronged no man. In that church, there were widows because of you. There are widowers because of you. There are fatherless children in that church because you killed their fathers. And you came to that church and you had the audacity to tell them, receive us. We have defrauded no man. Yes, the person that defrauded you guys died on the way to Damascus. It is no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. There are some scriptures when we read them, you just shout and just celebrate. Because that's your reality. Somebody shout at me, brand new man. No past, only a future. Amen. Receive us. We've defrauded nobody, we have wronged nobody. We have deprived nobody. Receive us. Stop looking at us like that. <laughs> this is not the man that did something. This is a new man. You never met him before. Nice to meet you for the first time. <laughs> yeah. That's the audacity with which you must function. That's the audacity. When the devil is telling you, take it easy, tell him, easy. where do we know each other? How? How? On what basis are we discussing? Shut up and get up, my friend. Amen. I said, amen. amen. Say, I'm justified. On perfect legal grounds. Amen. Let's push it a bit. Let's push it a bit. Let's push it a bit. Let's push this thing a bit. I like this kind of meetings, man. No hurry in life. Romans 8.31. <laughs> no hurry Romans 8 31 put it up <laughs> Romans chapter 8 verse 31 I love that scripture Romans 8 31 what shall we then say to these things if God be for us who can be against us wow that's a rhetoric question if God be for us who can be against us? The word if is used for two things in the book of Hebrews. Number one, it is used for the word since. Since God be for us. That's the word if. It's used for since. That is because God is for us, who can be against us? The second way it is used is as a rhetorical question. Where he will ask the question and answer it himself. 
If God be for us, who can be against us? Okay? He that spared his son and gave him up for us, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? So, you can choose which one. Either to use it as a rhetoric question or to use the word since or because. Okay? But I believe this one is rhetoric. The word before is the same word. Okay? Before. Before. That is, if God has justified you, what can stand against you? If God has justified you, who can accuse you? If God has justified you, who can condemn you? Then, after establishing that once you are at, you know, acquitted by God, nobody has the legal right to condemn or accuse you, he now goes to verse 32. 32. He that spared not his own son. So let's deal with the word spared. He spared not his own son. The word spared is a word always used for judgment. It's always used for giving somebody over to judgment. He that spared not, meaning he gave over Jesus to judgment. You will see that word used in Romans 11.21. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4 and 5. It's like saying he that allowed judgment to be done to his own son is used for those who are judged. He spared not his own son means what is supposed to happen to the ungodly happened to his own son. What is supposed to happen to the ungodly happened to his own son. Used for people who sinned. You can look at God justifying us. You can look at the love side of it. God justified us because he loves us. Yeah, but that's not really the point. His loving us is the motivation for the justification. He loves us. That's why he's going to justify us. Okay? But the love is not the legal ground. His love is the motivation. The act was not love. The motive was love, but the act of justifying you was not love. What moved him to justify you was love. The act was righteous. The motivation was love. But what justified you was a righteous act. He demonstrated his love. But what he did was not just love. It was a perfect legal thing. What was that? But delivered him up. That word delivered him up. It means to hand over to. God handed him over to. Now notice where it was used. It's a term used for betrayal. A term to give him up or deliver him up is a term that is used for betrayal. When you betray somebody. Okay, so which means what God did to Jesus was betrayal. But this betrayal was betrayal by consent. Betrayal by consent. When someone gives you up to your enemy. Look at Matthew 18, 34 where that word is used. Matthew chapter 18, verse number 34. Matthew chapter 18, verse number 34. Glory to God. And his Lord was wrought and delivered him to the tormentors. Delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So God delivered Jesus up to the tormentors. Look at Matthew 27, 26, where the word again, delivered up was used. Matthew 27, 26. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, scourged him, he delivered him to be crucified. He delivered him to be crucified. That is, he handed him over into the hands of his enemies. 
Romans 1, 28. Romans 1, 28. The use of that word delivered up. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up. He gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. I'm sure you remember I did some exegesis on that during 30 days of glory. God didn't give them up. They gave God up. Because God gives nobody up. They gave God up in their minds and did things that were not convenient. That's actually the way it is in the original. It's not God that gave them up. They gave God up. But the giving up here, you know, is to, to into the hands of betrayers or enemy. So God did not deliver Jesus to himself. Okay? He delivered Jesus to his enemy. Who is the enemy of Jesus? Death. He handed him over to death. Death is an enemy. God gave Jesus up to his enemy. Death. Why can't, why it can't be used for betrayal in this case? Jesus is God in the flesh. And like I said, the death was an act of his will. Very strong words. And brother Paul is very intentional in the use of words. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2. A lot of scriptures but good for your saintly dignity. Glory to God. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2. And walk in love even as Christ also hath loved us and had given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. He gave himself up for as an offering. The word gave himself up means he handed over himself. If you can focus on the past tense of God's love, you will understand why God loves you now. And that's why every time the Bible talks about the love of God, he will put loved, 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 loved. Because the love of God for you now is predicated on the love he had for you. Used for handing over to an enemy. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, look at it. Hebrews chapter 2 verse number 14. Hebrews chapter 2 verse number 14. For as much then as the children are particles of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. That through death, he might destroy. I love God, man. Did you see the sense of humor in that? Death is ravaging everybody. Then Jesus decided, I'm going to destroy him that had the power of death. And I'm not going to destroy him through strength. I'm going to submit myself to that same death and in that death I will destroy him. That's how weak Satan is. If I come with strength, it will be an overkill. I'm going to come through death so that he won't even decipher who is coming. For had the princes of this world known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Through death, he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. So, Jesus used the devil's weaponry to destroy the devil. That's how little, that's how pinchomic, that's how myopic, and that's how microscopic <laughs> the devil is. You know, you read the Bible, the devil started out as a serpent and ended up in Revelation as a dragon. How did he increase in size? The way believers talk. They use the creative power of God in their mouth to say Satan is powerful. So they use their words to create a, a, a dragon out of a little serpent. But the Bible says on that day, when we shall see him, then he will have been debloated. You understand? Debloated. <laughs> The devil will have been debloated. Then the Bible says we shall narrowly look at him. We shall say, ah, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Ah, isn't this thing that weakened the nations? So that already should give you an idea that this guy they call Satan is one pinchomic stuff. He's not supposed to occupy space in the events of your life. Where you are seated, he doesn't have access there. You are seated in Christ. 
The devil cannot be found in Christ. I'm, I'm teaching good this. Far above all principality and power. That's where you're seated. Glory to God. Glory to God. Say with me, I'm seated. Far above principalities and powers. That's where I am. In Christ Jesus. Glory to God. I said glory to God. He might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And deliver them who all through their lifetime were subject to bondage through the fear of death. So death is the power of the devil. It's not God who uses the power of death. God never uses death. But Jesus submitted himself to death. So why will somebody not be against us? He says, shall he not also with him freely give us all things? The word there is the word charizomai. It's used for something that is far. That is, shall he not favor someone who gave himself to the enemy for you? What will not be difficult for him to do? Someone who gave himself to the enemy because of you. What else will be difficult for him to do for you? He took himself and gave to his own enemy because of you. What else will he not do for you? I mean, just think about it. You never solicited for, you never requested for, you never fasted for, you never prayed for, you never believed for. That's why when all these funny preachers go around saying you have to sow a seed to get something. They irritate me. Because that's fraud in the afternoon. So God is so puny that you must have some filthy looker filthy looker to throw at him. Then he says, wonderful. I feel it. Then God will fall under the anointing. And say, yeah, 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 yeah. Especially if it's pound sterling. You know, if it's American dollars, God will fly. If it's Nigerian Naira, God will dance. But if it's Paul Sterling, God will just fall under the power. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel it. I feel it. My son, it has happened. What? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Oh. He said, if I wanted food, I would not ask you. If I wanted anything, my son, what do you have? The cattle upon a thousand hills, they all belong to me. Why will I need anything from you to do something for you? Can't you see how evil and wicked and filthy and smelly that gospel is? I gave myself to my enemy for you. Then to do something for you, I will now get something. I didn't ask for something from you to die for you in the worst case of your sin. I forgive you your sin free of charge. Is it to answer your prayer? I need something from you. How many of you pay your biological father to talk to you? Daddy, come, come, come. I want to talk to you, but take hundred dollars. How many minutes will hundred dollars allow for two of us? No father does that. Not even an area father. If you don't know what an area father is, don't worry. In future, you will understand by and by. <laughs> because I don't even have to explain it. Not even an area father. If you that are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Somebody shout, much more. Much more. You didn't fast for Jesus to die. Then now you want to fast for him to answer your prayer. Isn't something wrong with you? You need to check something. How many of you fast to talk to your biological parents? How many of you? What did he say to Jesus? Why do your disciples not fast? Jesus said, why will they fast? Why are they going to fast? Am I not here with them? 
Why will you fast when I'm with you? He said, the day shall come when I will be gone and they will fast. And they fasted three days. And the moment he rose from the day, they fast, he ended. it. <laughs> Bloggers, be careful. Don't take that. <laughs> he said, Dr. Damina said, no more fasting. I never said so. <laughs> Glory to God. Somebody shout, Abba Father. Abba. Say, that's my father. Yeah. I don't care what you've been waiting for, for God to do for you. I, I just came to tell you, he's already done it. Amen. Honestly, 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 I swear to God, he has already done it. <laughs> Somebody said, how can a man of God swear? Even God swear. God said, because he could swear by none greater, he swore by him. So I swear to God. <laughs> well, lie it and lie. Whatever you are believing God for has happened already. Receive, 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 receive. Somebody shout, I receive it. Right now, it's mine. Every delay cancelled. Stagnation cancelled. Everything blocking it is taken out of the way. Receive manifestation. Receive manifestation. Glory to God. Somebody shout, I receive, I receive. Somebody shout, I have it now. As a child of God, God wants your joy to be full. God wants you to have Full joy. Full joy. And it's, always. and it's always. He doesn't want you to have a little joy. here. No, no, no. Always. You cannot have a father and be moving like an orphan. That's right. No. I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you and he has come to you. I will never leave nor forsake you. He has spoken that I may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I shall not be afraid what man can do to me. I speak over you now. Whatever you were afraid of is destroyed right now. Amen. That fear is cancelled. That fear is cancelled. Somebody shall no fear here. God has not given us the spirit of bondage again to fear. He gave himself to his enemy. Because of you. He gave himself over to his enemy because of you. While you are still a criminal. How much more now that you have become his son? How much more now that you have become his son? You are called by his name. You bear his identity. His DNA flows in your body. Whoa! Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I'm telling you, things are shifting all over this place. What will have taken you 10 more years will happen within the next few weeks. Protocols are overtaking. Legislations are shifted. And room is created for your desires to manifest. Room is created for your desires to manifest. Favor is working for you. Amen. Favor with men. Amen. Favor with systems. Amen. Favor with government. Amen. And if you say amen to that, it's yours right now. Amen. Somebody shout, it's mine right now. In Jesus' name. Glory to God. He gave himself over to his enemy on your account. While you are yet a sinner. Jacolataba. Sit, let's push a little more. Sit, let's push a little more. Glory to God. So you need to understand that he gave himself over to his enemy. So, watch this. If he didn't ask for anything when he gave himself for you, will he now be asking for something? I mean, just think about it. He didn't ask for anything when he gave himself for you. 
Is it now that he's asking you for something? It doesn't add up. If there was a time you should have asked for something, was when he was giving himself over to your enemy, when you were not in his camp. But now, he did it for you while you were a stranger. And now you are a member of his family. I mean, just think about it. Just think about it. When you see us shouting and, and wailing, because many people don't like our God because he's been presented in the light of a God that is funny. Very funny. Very, very funny God like that. That you have to be very careful with him. Because you never can tell when he will lose control. <laughs> But I have news for you. I am the Lord, I change it not. The same yesterday, the same today, the same forever. No shadow of turning. So you can rely on him. He's so consistent that you can predict him. You can look at things and say, this is how God will behave in this situation. How many of you know when you have a consistent partner or a consistent friend... You can predict. That's right. yes. Yes. He's so consistent and you spent enough time with him. There are times he is asked something. You will tell him. You will answer for him. And exactly what you will have said is what you're saying. Because right. when you get used to somebody that is consistent, he is predictable. Mm. God is so consistent. If you really know him, you don't need to be wasting time. to say, Father, what do you want? You can say, Father, okay, I know exactly what you will have done and this is what you want here. That's the level to which we operate with God. You don't need to fast and pray to say, God, no, no, no. Uh, David in the Old Testament. David in the Old Testament. David in the Old Testament. David. 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 Under the blood of bulls and goats. Which he didn't even offer. You know, David didn't offer the animals. How many of you know? He said, God, wait. Animal sacrifice you have no pleasure in. Otherwise, I will have given. Which means he didn't give. Instead, he went to the temple with his boys and ate the one that others brought. <laughs> when you have revelation knowledge, there are some things you get away <laughs> Go ahead, oh God. David looked at Goliath and said, You? When I was with the lion and the bear, with my bare hands, I finished them. You're just one of them. I don't need prayer. I don't need strategy. I don't need fasting. I come against you in the name of the Lord. Bam! And he ran. Took off Goliath's head. He could tell that this guy, this cannot be God. He could tell this is not God. And he knew what to do with the guy. David. David was one guy, one very strange guy in the Old Testament that saw the New Testament. More than pastors of today who are in the New Testament. <laughs> you didn't hear that. David in the Old Testament saw the New Testament. More than so many today's pastors who are in the New Testament. Is it not David who said, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not his benefits. Who forgiveth all your sins. The blood has not been shed. But David knew that God's mind is forgiveness. Redeemeth your life from destruction. Reneweth your youth like an eagle. Filleth your mouth with good things. This is David in the Old Testament. David will say, oh God, if you should count iniquities, who can stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be fair. That's in the Old Testament. This guy already knew that God does not record evil. David didn't have sin consciousness. He killed somebody and just said, against you and you only have I sinned. <laughs> and he's the most quoted prophet of the, New, of the Old Testament. Even Jesus is sitting on his throne. What are you talking about? 
He sit on the throne of David. <laughs> Glory to God. There are things you just look at. The Bible says, who by reason of use have their senses exercised, they can discern. This, this cannot be God. It's, it's, it's direct. You, you, it's, you. Somebody is sick. You, you are still asking God, is he your will? Are you, are you together? Is his will for somebody to be sick? Whichever way that sickness came is not the will of God. That's why the Bible says, the prayer of faith shall heal the sick and if he has committed sin, it shall be forgiven. So in the healing will come with forgiveness because the same power that forgave your sin heals your body. You don't need extra prayer for healing. If your sins are forgiven at all, then you can receive healing at any time. I didn't know if you, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. The same power that forgave your sins heals your body. So once you receive forgiveness of sin, you can receive healing. You don't need a special application. You don't need a special. It's bread. Jesus calls you children's bread. Do your children fast and pray for bread? If bread is in the kitchen, they eat it. Yeah, they just go and grab it and eat. And you don't need protocol in eating bread. Bread is made in such a way that you can eat it without support. Healing is the children's bread. You don't need help for healing. Just stand up, grab it, and eat it whenever you need it. Say, I hear you. You just take it. You don't need special application. There are no steps to healing. Healing is your bread. Eat it when you need it. Somebody say, how do I eat it? My son, attend to my words. Incline your ears to my sin for their life to those who find them and held to all their flesh. Just take God's word and just chew God's word. Add voice to the word of God and speak it, speak it, speak it, speak it, speak it. Speak it until what you are speaking is more real than what you are feeling. Stand up and act on it. Just stand up and walk on it. And the doctor's report is cancelled. Suddenly, the doctors will say, we can't understand. We can't see what we saw. How can you see what you saw? Do you know who you are dealing with? The world doesn't know me. Glory to God. Are we teaching tonight? You're not a victim. You're not under. Don't let the world move you around and make you feel like it's all finished. Nothing has finished. It's just starting. The journey has just started. And I have news for you. You will win throughout the journey. Somebody shout, I'm winning. Things are working for me. I'm not hopeless. I'm not helpless. I have all the help that I will ever need. I am helped of God. Say, I am mightily helped of God. Say, I am the helped of God. Mightily. Ayada Bahodayas. Leo Mosakayada. Leo Rodasokaya. Jekula na mambo lehesu. Ale jogolada. Brenda no satala. Ea lobo saka. Wherever you are found, help will be looking for you. Help will be looking for you. Somebody shout, I am helped of God. Shakula na mambo. Kalo da mosaka ya. Kalo saparakatas. Kalo saparakatas. Glory to God. 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 He said, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. It's not the hills, it's in my spirit. Help is available in my heart. Somebody said, I have help on every side. I am massively helped by the Lord. You know, great things are going to be happening in your life. In the next few days, in the next few weeks, a lot of dramatic things will happen in your life. And when people ask you how, tell them I am massively helped of God. Glory to God. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I'm not afraid of anything. Glory to God. I am massively helped of God. Sulatabayatas. Sulatabalatas. 
very soon from now, when you walk into a place, your presence will demand an explanation. They'll say, who just entered? Who just entered? Who just entered? You will carry a presence. They will know somebody entered. And they cannot say no to you. Somebody shout, I hear you. Massively help of God. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. I said, glory to God. Shako Yatanas. If you can sit, sit for a minute. Let's push this thing. So watch, 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 watch. Paul is presenting an argument here that while you were a sinner, he died for you. While you were ungodly, he justified you. Much more now. So understand what it is and what it is not. You are only a beneficiary of justification. You are not even a party to it. You are just a beneficiary. You only waited to receive it. You added nothing to it. So that word charizomai is for something that is free. Kindness and favor. So settle this in your mind once and for all. God's attitude to sin is favor. God's attitude to sin is favor. God doesn't use sin. God doesn't tempt with sin. God doesn't overlook sin. Rather what he does, he favors the sinner on perfect legal grounds. He favors the sinner. How? By the death of his son, Jesus Christ. That's how God favors the sinner. You know, many people, the way they see salvation is, you know, altar call. The way you answer the altar call, God forgives you. The point is this. The favor you receive the day you receive Christ is the favor you will enjoy forever. That favor that God gave you as a sinner to receive his saving grace, you will enjoy that favor for the rest of your life. You don't need a new dose of favor. That one favor that brought you the forgiveness of sin and brought you into the family of God, that favor becomes your lifetime companion. You don't need a special favor. That one favor can take care of you all your lifetime. You just need to recognize that God's favor started working on your case from before you became saved. And now that you are saved, that favor has become your personal inheritance. And walk in that consciousness. Walk in that expectation. That favor. The favor of God. Hallelujah. Because there's just one sacrifice. So there cannot be two favors. There's just one sacrifice. And that one sacrifice made available everything. Glory to God. I say glory to God. David said, if thou, O Lord, will mark iniquities, who can stand? He said, O oh Lord, take not the Holy Spirit from me. Don't take the Holy Spirit from me. <laughs> David, in the Old Testament, knew that the Holy Spirit will not go. Today's pastors, they are losing Holy Spirit. So in every service, they are asking Holy Spirit to come. Because they lose him after every service. So in every service, they must welcome him back because they're going to lose him again. One man of God said, you lose salvation every day. You lose salvation every day. Is he really saved? I don't know whether he's really saved because you can't be really saved and not even know that the thing is staying. You lose it every day. So we lose salvation every day. Every day. So we receive it every day. We lose it every day. <clears throat> is that rest? <laughs> Salvation is rest. Something you are losing every day. Can that be rest? That is work. Come unto me only that labor. I will give you rest. That rest is salvation. And then you are receiving rest. And you are laboring. <laughs> Ignorance. You are safe forever. 
You are safe for how long? Forever. Huh? Forever. I didn't hear you. Forever. Even those that argue, it's because they know they are safe forever. forever. That's why they can argue. Because they know that their argument will not change it. <laughs> and they are coming around. They are coming around. They are coming around. They are coming around one by one. Yeah, one by one, they are coming around. They are coming around one by one. You understand? They are coming around. Even this week, some of them came around. Even this week. They came around. He said, you cannot lose salvation. Because whatever God do it, is permanent. They are coming around gradually. Don't worry, they will come around. How can you lose salvation? How can you lose what you do obtain? Is salvation an item on the shelf? Salvation is a, is a fusing of you and Christ into one. How can you lose it? And any salvation that cannot be assured, why do I want it? And why should I advertise it to somebody? A product I myself am not sure of. Then I go around asking people to acquire it. No, I have to be sure of it first before I advertise. So if Jesus said we should evangelize, it's because he knows that what he has given us is assured in us and we can advertise it to others. Say forever. Saved forever. Amen. Saved forever. Sin can never break that relationship. Sin can never, never Never, sin can never break the relationship you have with God. Never. If sin breaks that relationship, then the death of Jesus was a scam. And it wasn't a scam. It wasn't a scam. So sin can never break that relationship. Because the death of Jesus was the permanent cure for sin. Glory to God. Matthew 26, 28. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 26, verse number 28. Ooh. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The word aphesis, the word remission is the Greek word aphesis, E-P-A-P-H-E-S-I-S, aphesis. It means to take away, and there will be no record of it. Remission is aphesis, to take away, and there will be no record of it. The blood of Jesus is not a temporary solution to it. The blood of Jesus is a permanent solution to sin. So, he takes away sin from our relationship with God. It doesn't mean that man will never sin. Listen carefully, I have told you before. God did not create man to be able to sin. And God did not create man not to be able to sin. God did not create man to be able to sin. And God did not create man not to be able to sin. That's the way God created man. Do you understand? He didn't create man to be able to sin. Neither did he create man not to be able to sin. That's the way God created man. Because man is not a robot. Man has a free will. A man can choose what he wants to do. Do you understand? Yes. So, when we say your sins are forgiven, we are not saying you will not be able to sin again. Uh -uh. We are not saying that. But what we mean by the gift of the forgiveness of sin is that nothing will ever bring sin between you and God anymore. Nothing. Nothing. Somebody says, so when I sin, is God not aware? Not at all. He doesn't even know you sin. And he doesn't look at it. And he doesn't, it doesn't ever occur to him. It's only you that know you sin. And maybe Satan, who likes to take record. And maybe the, the people that were affected by the sin. But God is not. You know why? 
you are in Christ where there is no sin. So when he looks at you, he doesn't see you. He sees Christ. And in Christ is the solution to sin. So that sin can never interfere between you and God. Because Christ the advocate is the one that keeps you. And his sacrifice is actively at work ensuring that no sin survives what his blood has achieved. So sin can never stand between the believer and God. Never. It can never stand. Now, religion can't handle that, but that's Bible. Glory to God. Say with me, sin can never stand between me and God. It's impossible for... See, Luke 24, 47 says, the remission of sins is preached. So the gospel is the gospel of the remission of sins. The gospel is the gospel of the remission of sins. Which means righteousness is a gift of God's justification. Righteousness is a gift of God's justification. That is God did what was right to justify you. It's not like God just said, you know what, let's overlook. No, your sins have been paid for. They are paid for. Your sins have been paid for. They are paid for. That's why you can be justified. They are paid for. You would have been punished. But yes, you were punished. You were thoroughly punished. And the punishment for your sin was not just your present sin or your past sin. The punishment for your sin included your sins of the future. All, they were punished. The only difference is that they were punished on Christ on your behalf. They've all been punished. They've all been punished. All sins have been punished. All. Like I always say, God went into the eternity future and went into the eternity past. He looked at all of humanity and what humans are capable of committing to the worst times a billion times over took all and put the punishment on Christ. So when Christ took that punishment, he was carrying the punishment of sins from Genesis to the end of the age. He took all at once. It's not just, uh, he didn't just die. Look at Hebrews 9.15. Hebrews 9.15. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15. And for this cause, he's the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, the vehicle of death, the instrumentality of death, for the redeem redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. So the death of Jesus covered from Adam. It covered from Adam. It covered right up to Abel, Enoch, Noah, right down. To when he died. Then it passed into the future. All the children that will be born on earth. That have not been born. Were calculated into the equation. Somebody said how did God know? That's why he's God. He sees the end from the beginning. He looked at everything. He took all the sins of man and put on Christ. And Christ died for it once and for all. So in his resurrection. He resurrected with life for everybody. That's why even children that are not born, when they are born, no matter what sin they commit, once they believe the gospel, their sins are forgiven by that one sacrifice. Am I teaching at all? Am I communicating? Yeah, because you need to know that that gives you the audacity to relate with God without fear. It gives you the audacity to function in the supernatural and in the miraculous power of God. So righteousness is a gift of God's justified act. A gift of God's justified act. We are righteous because of the righteous act. Because we have seen that the act of God was righteous. The Bible says he purged our sins. In Hebrews 1.3, he purged our sins. 
To purge means to clear out. He cleared out our sins. Hebrews 8, 12. Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 12. Hebrews 8, 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. I will not remember it anymore. I will not take account of it. That's the meaning of remember. It doesn't mean I will have memory loss. I will not take account. Amen. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. Are you still here? Yeah. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience. Somebody say my conscience. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 and 2. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things can never, can never, with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year, continually make the commas they are on too perfect. So they were coming with animals every year, animals every year, animals every year. They were killing animals every year to cover for their sins. Every year they were bringing animals. They were busy bringing animals. And these animals couldn't take care of the issue. Next verse. For then will they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once Purged should have had no more conscience of sins. If those animal sacrifices were working, it should have purged the people from sin consciousness. But it never worked. It never worked. Look at the next verse. It never worked. Verse 3. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. So the animal sacrifices they gave every year is like believers who confess sin every time they pray. Because every time you confess your sin, it's like bringing an animal for sacrifice. And just like the animals could not take away sin, that's why your sins will continue to be in your face. There are churches where they will tell you, confess your sin before service starts. Say, confess. And in that church, they have created a prayer that does not exist anywhere. But the sins are committed, and the ones they have not committed. See? Knowingly or unknowingly. Directly or indirectly. Willingly or unwillingly. Consciously or unconsciously. You understand? It's a new prayer that does not exist anywhere. <laughs> willingly or unwillingly. Oh, Father. The one I know, the one I don't know. <laughs> it is not possible that confessing sins should take away sins. It is not possible that begging God for forgiveness will take away sins. It's not possible. Look at it in verse 3. For, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Verse 4, verse 4, verse 4. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. It is not possible. Now, look at the word perfect. It could not make the people who bring the offering perfect. It's the word teleo. T-E-L-E-I-O-O. T E L E I O O. It means accomplished. It means to be fulfilled. That's the meaning of teleo. To be accomplished, to be fulfilled, it means to come to the end. In other words, the remembrance of sin is a proof that the worshiper is not fulfilled. Yeah. The confession of sins is a proof. That the worshiper is not fulfilled. You're confessing your sin because you're still seeking righteousness. You couldn't have arrived at righteousness and be confessing sin. So the confession of sin is an indication that you have not yet arrived at an understanding of who you are in Christ. So that's why you keep confessing endlessly. And let me tell you something else. When you start confessing sin always, it breaks your ability to be strong. It weakens you. It makes you a coward. And it makes you never to be able to stand. When the devil roars, you run like those pastors run out of the building and left only the girl that had demons to take over the place. She was in dominion and they were running. Sin consciousness makes a coward out of a man. 
It makes you a coward. You'll be running from things that should be running away from you. Sometimes they will ask you a question that you know the answer, but you answer stupid things because sin consciousness makes a fool out of you. And the devil knows that. The devil knows that. And that's why one of the greatest missions I have is to get believers out of sin consciousness into Christ consciousness. So we can see God's power manifest like never before. Glory to God. I say glory to God. I say glory to God. Somebody say what if I've done bad before? It's only you that knows you've done bad. God doesn't have the record. Why are you keeping the record? Who is he helping? Who is he helping? You think you are being humble by confessing yourself. You are being stupid. Very stupid. That's what you are. Because the person that you should be telling your sins says, even me, I will not keep record. Then you, you are keeping record and you are bringing the record to him. And he says, hey, I don't want record. If it's record, you can't keep record better than I. Are you not being stupid? Okay, you are being foolish. Oh, fools. Let me use foolish so that I can have Bible verses to support it. <laughs> because as, when, you, when you keep confessing sin, you will soon find out that when you tell demons, come out, they will tell you, you come out. And you will go out. <laughs> because you have no confidence, you have no boldness. Nothing breaks the strength of the spirit of a man like sin consciousness. It will break your spirit and make you a weakling. You have the spirit of a superman. But it is operating like a vegetable. Because it has been all the, all the, all the substance and strength that that spirit is supposed to muzzle has been siphoned by sin consciousness. You see a believer praying and getting confused in the prayer. Oh Lord our Father, oh Lord our Father. Instead of saying I'm coming, you say I'm going. And God is like, what are you talking about? Sin consciousness is confusing you. You even pray and bite your tongue. Because when you were not supposed to talk, you went and spoke. Because your brain is not calculating very well. <laughs> but when you have righteous consciousness, you are in charge. You don't speak too many words. You speak few words and you stand by them. And you see them come to pass. Glory to God. Glory to God. That's what Elijah did to Oman Camel to those stupid people. He said, he said, call on your God. Let me call on my God. You call first. And they started, oh Baal, oh Baal, oh Baal, oh Baal, oh Baal, 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 Baal is not coming. Elijah said, Come, 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 guys. It's like he traveled. Shout, shout, shout. Oh Baal, oh Baal, oh Baal, oh Baal. He said, Hey, he's asleep. Shout louder. Oh Baal. He punished them. Cut yourselves with knife. Fia, 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 fia. When he sees blood, he will come. Fia, fia. <laughs> when your enemy becomes a prayer leader, <laughs> you'll be in trouble, man. And then at the time of the evening sacrifice, Elijah put the things, the altar together, put the wood, pour, poured gallons of water, poured gallons of water. Somebody shout confidence. Poured gallons of water. Put, bring more water. Say, Father, that they may know that I've done this at your word. And that they may know that you have turned their hearts back again to you. And serve him by fire. The fire came up, licked up the wood and the fire and everything. That miracle just happened. And all the gods of, of Israel were dumbfounded. They were all dumbfounded in the presence of a man who has confidence in his God. That's why the New Testament will say Elijah was a man of like passion. That means the only thing to learn from him, Elijah is how he prayed. He prayed earnestly. Bam! And it rained. Then he prayed and stopped the rain. He says, so the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man today availeth much. It make it tremendous. Available. Dynamic. See, this power is already in your spirit. So now when you pray, you bring it out. And then you channel it. Kabayada. Kabayada. 
How can you be a powerhouse and things are not working? Pull it out, man. Pull it out, man. Rise up like an edifice. Higher and higher. Higher and more, Shakaya. Glory to God. Glory to God. Don't you never say I'm a powerhouse? That's what you are. All the power is on your inside. You are the powerhouse. Glory to God. Glory to God. The exceeding greatness of his power to us what who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought where in Christ. When he raised him from where? The dead. That same power is on your inside. Hey, I tell you man. It's on your inside. So whatever was not working, you just need to speak. It will start working. The power that raises the dead is on your inside. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Say, I raise the dead. Say, I call the things that be not as though they were. Say, creative power is on my inside. Resurrection power is on my inside. I say it and I see it, and I have it. Glory to God. You carry that power on your inside. The power that raised Jesus from the dead. The power that the devil could not keep down is on the inside of the born again man. Glory to God. Glory to God. Give me a few more minutes before we take a break, man, I tell you. Let's push, let's push, let's push. Jesus has perfected you forever. Somebody say, I'm perfected? Forever. Say, I am sanctified? Forever. Say, I do not confess sins because I am fulfilled in the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus. I am fulfilled. Amen. I said, Amen. So the death of Jesus perfects the worshiper. He ever lived to make intercession for the sins. Ever. He ever lived. The Bible says he's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the world. The word propitiation is the word hilasmos. Hilasmos. It means to pay for sin and prevent wrath and anger. That's the meaning of propitiation. To pay for sin and prevent wrath and anger. Hilasmos. So Jesus is the permanent prevention of wrath against sin for us. He is the permanent prevention of wrath against sin for us. The work of Christ is not temporal. The work of Christ is permanent. So whatever we get from this permanent work of Christ is also permanent. Which means my righteousness is permanent. It means my justification is permanent. It means my acceptance before God is permanent. It means my holiness in Christ is permanent. Whatever we get from him is permanent. Don't forget righteousness is a permanent state. Because the, because the act of being made righteous was a permanent act. He died once and for all to make you righteous once and for all. Did you get that? He died once and for all to make you righteous once and for all. He doesn't have to die anymore because you wouldn't need to be righteous anymore. You're already righteous once and for all. Are we together? If our heart condemns us, he said, God is greater than our heart. That means my heart can be wrong. My heart can be wrong. Sometimes you have people say, no, I want to do it, but my heart is not allowing me. My heart is, shut up. Go and school your heart. <laughs> your heart is not allowing because it's unschooled. My heart is not allowing me. My heart, your heart is untrained. So it can't be directing you. It's not trained. It's not skillful. So it will deny you even opportunities that God brought for you. It will reap you. I mean, it will, it will, it will, it will deprive you things that are yours. Say, no, my conscience. Mm, 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 my conscience. My conscience. 
My conscience cannot rest. My conscience, my conscience, untrained conscience. Your conscience is untrained. That's why it's panicky. Because he's seen what it has not seen before. So, oh, no, 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 inside me. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody that is not born again will just get in there and do it and succeed and go away. He said, ah, I wish. Wish what? <laughs> that guy is not born again. And yet he has a, a heart that is strong to handle it. You, you are born again. Religion has cheated you. Wrong Bible teaching. Wrong Bible teaching. So in a few minutes, I'm going to show you how to make your conscience. How to make your conscience stay with God's purpose and not deny you of what is yours. Because that's very critical. So, if our heart condemns us. Now, it's important for you to know that heart there is not your spirit. The heart in that scripture is not your spirit. The heart in that scripture is not your spirit. It's your will, your emotions, okay? Your will, your emotions, and your mind. That's what that contest is calling heart. Not your spirit. There are some people that thought, and I was taught that kind of thing many years ago, and it really messed me up for a bit, that the conscience is the voice of the spirit. No, your conscience is not the voice of your spirit. No. So don't be following your conscience. Because your conscience can be wrong. There's no reliability that your conscience will be right. So you can't follow your conscience. It's like some people say, follow your heart. And what they mean, follow your heart, is follow your untrained heart. Yeah? You can't follow that. Unbelievers can, but not you. Because you know better than that. Remember, we're talking about sin consciousness. Many of us, we trust our conscience a lot. We depend on our conscience. But you do not realize that your conscience is an act of your will. Your conscience is an act of your will. Your conscience is you. Your conscience is you. Your conscience is not the voice of the Holy Spirit. Your conscience is your own making. Now, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4 and 5. Are you blessed? 1 yes, Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4 and 5. I want all of us to read. This is beautiful. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 4 and 5. Let's go one to go. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. We know. Somebody say, we know. We know. Tell your neighbor, you need to know. Need to know. Tell your neighbor, only knowledge will bail you out. So let's get back. We know that an idol is nothing in this world. And that there is none other God but one. You know what he's saying? There are no idols. Those things they call idol. Those things they call charm. Those things they call talisman. They are fake. They don't exist. I'm not joking. Cultism. Freemasonry, uh, Oboni, Amok, Indian Cham, Indian Cham Talisman, none of them exist. I'm not joking. They don't exist. And if anybody brings it close to you, collect it, squeeze it, and throw it away. And tell him, what is that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I told you the story of how they took me to a shrine that was killing people in a family. I urinated there and entered the car. I told him, let's go. That was the end. I didn't pray. My words are too precious for that useless thing. They don't exist. (laughs) 
They don't exist. I went with a friend of mine who is a businessman to visit his business partner, an Indian guy who was born in incense in the afternoon. Immediately we entered the place. I stretched my hand and I shook him. He pulled out his hand and he asked his partner, who is that man? He told him, that's my pastor. And he said, that guy. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> that guy. So the guy was telling me on our way going, he said, you shook that man. I said, what happened? He said, you shook him. I said, how? He said, I don't know, but it's like when you shook his hand, something entered him. I said, yes. Power, pass, power. <laughs> I didn't even speak. I only shook him. Bam! Light and darkness. <laughs> that same power that raised Christ is what you're carrying. You just need to be conscious of it as you go. That's all. Hey, Lebo Shakaya. Yeah. Yeah. And as your confidence grows, you become strong in your mind. So when you engage, your mind is like ironclad, solid. You're not moved. Amen. Amen. Are we teaching here? As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered. How many of you, you understand what we're talking about? People go to sacrifice things to idols, right? Huh? People go to sacrifice, okay. So, we know that an idol is nothing in the, is nothing. We know that those things are empty. Whether they come from Africa. You know, they used to throw them. Or they come from where? It's nothing in this world and that there is none other God but one. Next verse. Let's read the next verse together. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many. Next verse. But to us, there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we are in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. There are no gods. Look at verse 7. How be it? Huh? How be it? How be it? There is not in every man that knowledge. For some, for some, with the conscience of the idol. There is no idol. The idol is in their conscience. The idol only exists in their consciousness. There are no idols. With the conscience of the idol unto this hour, eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. So when they throw that charm at you, and your conscience recognizes the existence of that charm, then it works. It is not working because the charm is working. It is working because inside you, you have created room for that thing to work. Otherwise, it does not exist. Are we teaching here? Yes. It's a knowledge something. You've got to know that those things don't exist. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. But if you don't know, it will exist inside your conscience. And your conscience will defile your body. Are you following? Let me tell you a story here that will drive this point home. Two brothers own an orchard. Okay? I've told that story before. Two brothers own an orchard and one of the brothers discovered that the villagers where they had this orchard with mangoes, bananas, and all that, they had all the kind of things in there. And the villagers envied because the thing was blossoming and doing very well. So the elder brother was to travel and leave town. But he knows his junior brother cannot contend with the villagers. So in the night before his travel, he went into the orchard 
and planted needles, needles on the tree with trade and created some kind of charm looking thing all over the orchard. And villagers knew such things. So they thought he had charmed the whole orchard. Then he traveled without telling his brother because he didn't want his brother to, you know, either tamper with us. He just did it quietly. The brother came into the orchard in the morning and began to take fruit without observing the charm. And as he began to eat, he now noticed the thread, the needles. Fear came over him and he became sick. Instantly, he started developing temperature. He became so critically sick, managed to get home and told the people around the neighborhood that he's feeling very sick, that these villagers hate his family. They poisoned the orchard. He didn't know. He went in there and ate, and now he's so sick. So they tried to reach his elder brother. Finally, they got in touch with his elder brother. Your brother is critically sick. I, I just left home which day. He says, very sick. You need to come back quickly so you can do something about him. So the elder brother came and said, but I just left. And the brother was in bed, can't even come down. The fear has finished him. And the brother said to him, what happened? He said, the day you left, that morning, I went to the orchard to go and eat some fruits. And I didn't know that they came and jammed the orchard. <laughs> And the brother said, wait, 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 wait. Is it a black thread? He said, yes. And the needles? He said, yes. I planted it. The brother sat up and said, what? <laughs> <laughs> he sat up and said, what? So you are the one that put all those things. He said, yes. You're sure? He said, yes. He said, let's go. Let me show you. So the brother stood up. No more sickness. They went to the orchard. He told him, I put all this because I was traveling and I didn't want them to come and eat them because you can't fight them. That's why I put it there. The brother said, wow, I, you should have told me. I'm fine. <laughs> his weak conscience defiled his body. But now the moment he realized that such a thing never existed, the weak conscience became strong. The body came back. That's how these things work. That's how these things work. And that's why you've got to know your authority in Christ is far above all principalities and powers. No demonic orchestration works on your case. Because when you're seated, the devil can't operate there. If I'm teaching, shout, I hear you. Their weak conscience defiled them. Okay? So that's what happens to believers. Now, please take down this. Your conscience is a product of the knowledge that you have. So if a man goes to church and all he keeps hearing is not the emphasis of what Christ has done, it produces in him a weak conscience. You know, all these people that go to churches where every Sunday they will tell them about demons, the five fingers of Lucifer. The five fingers of Lucifer. Uh, you know, the, the left leg of Satan. You know, the intestines of Jezebel. The mystery, the mystery of the marine spirits. Okay. The, 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 the dynamics of incubus and succubus. Incubus and succubus. Incubus and succubus mean one is lying on the floor, another is lying on top. Incubus and succubus. The mystery of Semiramis. Semiramis. The mystery of Semiramis. The depths of Satan. Unlocking the depths of Satan. The mystery behind dreadlocks. The mystery. <laughs> the spirit behind attachment. The spirit behind attachment. You don't know where that hair was brought from. It was sacrificed in the marine kingdom. To initiate women. When they have taught you all those kind of things. They break your conscience. They break your heart. So any little thing from the kingdom of darkness. Oh, you are panicking. You can't function in authority. But when you begin to hear about what Christ has done. How he defeated the devil 2000 years ago. Where you are seated. What you have. Your heart is a. Glory to God. 
Are we teaching good here? Now watch, I'm going to show you a few scriptures and then I'm done with this session. Are you blessed this morning? All right, all right, all right, all right. I'm enjoying this. I went to a church where the pastor was preaching about the Jeze Jezebelitan spirit. I said, what? He said, Jeze Jezebelitan spirit. Then he talks about Leviathan, Leviathan, <laughs> Leviathan. <laughs> Wonderful. These people, the mystery these people control, even brother Paul didn't have it. These people have seen things that even the Holy Spirit cannot reveal. Yeah. Go to your village and bring sand. Bring sand from your village with a dangerous seed. It's not the sand, it's the seed. <laughs> Even in the UK here, they bring sand. Eh? From where? Which airline flies the sand? <laughs> Sand from the village. Oh my word. Sand. No, no. No, no. Which scripture? From dust thou art to dust thou shalt go. Is that a scripture? Because I can't tell which scripture they are using. And you actually travel and go and bring sand? Not even for crusade. <laughs> Ignorance is gone riot, man. So go and bring sand. Go and bring something. For what? For what? They say faith extender. Why is the faith? <laughs> Why is the faith a dwarf? Why does he need extension? <laughs> Do you know what faith is? Faith is Jesus. Jesus is the author and the finisher. He cannot need extension. If Jesus is not enough, something is wrong with you. So you have to extend Jesus. Faith extender. For what? All those are doctrines of devils. Doctrines of what? Devils. devils because they will lead into more bondage. The doctrines of devils. The doctrines of devils. They are, not, they are not the gospel of Christ. It's another gospel, which is not another. It's actually a manipulative gospel. It's not the message of the, of, 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 of the resurrection of Jesus. And you know, as believers, we've got to liberate people. That's why you're in the United Kingdom. You're the light that this nation is waiting for. And I prophesy you will shine this light. That amen is not an anointing. I said you will shine this light. Say with me, I will shine the light. In this nation, men in darkness will come to the light. Amen. 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 We will shake this nation from the west to the south, from the east to the north. We will shake it in, out, out, in. And the devil will have nothing left for him here. If you are with me on this, shout a powerful amen. Now look at this. So, these people use those teachings to keep people's consciences weak. I tell you, the reason why you cannot marry is because of the kind of dreams you're having, the kind of dreams you're having. Do you have dreams where you are breastfeeding a child? Yes, because you have a spiritual husband. In the spirit world, you have like 20 children, even though in the physical you don't have. So all your physical children have been transferred to the spirit. That's why you cannot have children here. White and red fowl. <laughs> fowl spirit on top of. And they do these things and they carry a serious face. And people believe them without asking questions. So, you know, you know the reason why Dr. Damina is talking like this because he has no spiritual understanding. He's just a lecturer, he doesn't have spiritual understanding. <laughs> Any spirituality that is outside the scripture. It's not the spirit of God. Because the spirit of God and the word of God always agree. Are we teaching here? Don't let all, those are all deceptive things. They are not Bible. Where you're seated, the devil can't come there. 
Devil can't come there. Moreover, you can't have a spiritual husband. You can't have a spiritual wife. Because there's no such things in the spirit. Marriage is earthly and it ends here. There's no marriage outside this life. It, there's no marriage outside this physical world. Once you leave this world, you are not going to appear as husband and wife. That knowledge ends here. As you drop this body, that knowledge drops you this body. When you wear the heavenly body, you will not remember that this was my wife or husband. Even your children will not know you are my parents. We are all going to be brethren and sisters, a family of God. It's going to be the father and his family. So where did you get spiritual husband from or spiritual wife? All these spiritual manipulations. Where did he get all of that from? Those are called doctrines of devils. And I'm going to show you from scripture. I come from Africa and I live there. I live there. The headquarter where they go to bring the sun. That's where I dwell. <laughs> and I can tell you all those things are fake. Because I live there. I live there. And I don't see these things. Somebody said to me, I left, I left Africa to go to America because I was running away from witches. He said, yesterday it was revealed that my roommate is the chairman of witches in America. <laughs> then he said to me, what do I do? I said, come back home. <laughs> At least here we don't have the chairman. <laughs> come home. <laughs> you don't need to stay in America. Come back to Nigeria. We are safer here. Because there you are with the chairman. Here we don't have a chairman. <laughs> there cannot be two chairmen. <laughs> Seated far above. I give you power to trample over serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the devil. And nothing shall by hurt you nothing. Take the word of God the way it is. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing. And when we say nothing, we mean nothing. Amen. Amen. Nothing. Because that's what you have. That's where you are in Christ. Where all of power and all authority operates from. You're not a victim, you're a victor. The power of God resides in you. Glory to God. I say glory to God. Amen. Say with me, I am the righteousness of God. There are no idols. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19, see the way, you know, the scriptures speak concerning this. Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 to 22. Having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Next verse. But a new and living way which he had consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say his flesh. Next verse. And having an high priest over the house of God. 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. That heart that makes you think that there are evil spirits, they are after you, demons, witches, wizards, is an evil conscience. Purge it by the word of God. From an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Our bodies washed. Our conscience purged so we can live in the freedom that we have in Christ. You have, to, you have to understand that when he says true heart, he's talking about true assurance, full assurance of faith. So remember what John said, let us assure our hearts. Let us assure. Tell your heart, I am in authority here. Tell your heart, I cannot tolerate and accommodate fear. Let us draw nigh with a full assurance. Your heart is sprinkled. You need to feed your heart. Keep your heart down and feed it. Tell your heart what the truth is concerning you in Christ. And I've told you the heart refers to the mind. Amen? The heart refers to the mind. The emotions. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8. 
as we round off. Hebrews 13 verse 8. We're going to read together like a mass choir. Hebrews 13 8. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Next verse. Next verse. Let's go one to go. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrine. What a strange doctrine? Confess your sin before prayer. That's a strange doctrine. It's nowhere in the Bible. What is strange doctrine? Eat bread and drink Ribena. It's called communion service. Communion service. Dr. Damina. Native Dr. Damina. He's a native doctor, Damina. He is destroying the pillars of Christianity. How can Dr. Damina say you cannot eat bread and, and, and ribina? Don't be angry. I know you're always hungry. <laughs> bread and ribina is a strange doctrine. Some say, but the Bible says, as often as you do this, you do in remembrance of me. Do you do memorial service to somebody that is alive? Is Jesus dead or alive? Why are you doing memorial service? Do you remember somebody that is living with you? <laughs> so somebody is living with you and you are remembering him. They are doing armed forces remembrance day. <laughs> Why do I have to remember Jesus when he's alive in me? He's the one walking in me. He walketh in me, but to will and to do of his good pleasure. And why should I have to remember him? Did I forget him? So Do I have memory loss? I don't need it. And then somebody says, if you drink it and eat it ungodly, you'll be sick and die. And then he says, the blood is shed for the remission of sin. That means the people that should drink it are people that have sin. And yet they say you cannot drink it if you have sin. Then it's useless. Is it not useless? So why are we drinking it? Moreover, if you really read that scripture very clearly, he wasn't talking about eating and drinking stuff. He was talking about walking in love. And then when Paul was teaching walking in love, he now said, I remember that night when Jesus took bread to exemplify the love walk. He broke it and said, this is my body. So this my body is broken for all of you, which means you are a family. And this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission of sins. And he says, and as often as you do this feast, because it was an ongoing feast, you are doing it with me in mind that I'm the reason for this feast. Now, Jesus has come. No more feast. Christ is now our Passover. And he lives in you. So you don't have to eat and drink. You don't have to eat and drink. We are the bread. All of us together are the bread. So when he says, what does he mean by you're sick, you're weak, and you die? He said, because you do not discern the body. What is the body? We do not discern one another. We do not share. Somebody is among us who is very hungry. Very, very hungry. And we just lay hands on him. Be blessed. Be blessed. Enjoy your Saturday, brother. The guy is hungry. He's, he's not prayer he needs. He needs you to touch your pocket and say, Bros, what's up, man? Be blessed. Not be blessed. It's time for everything, my friend. <laughs> so because we do not discern one another, somebody is critically sick and cannot afford Medicare. And you are in that service 
And the Spirit of God is leading you to bless him with some money that will be enough for him to go to the hospital. But you are not discerning. Then you procrastinate. And the service is over. And we say we came to fellowship. But now we fellowshiped, but we didn't fellowship. And this person goes on, but because he couldn't go to the hospital that night, he dies. And then tomorrow, he, oh, that brother just passed. I! I! No, I is too late. You should have done I! Not I! <laughs> so, Paul is now saying, because we are not discerning of one another, some people among us, out of our carelessness are dying. Some are weak and some are sick. He's not talking about eating something. He's talking about looking after each other because all of us are the bread and all of us carry the blood of Jesus. We are a family. That's what Paul was teaching using the parable of eating and drinking to communicate spiritual realities. That's all. You don't say go and be eating things every service. Till some people are saying, uh, you know, that when they ate the communion, since the time they ate it, they have never lacked something. Since I came to this commission, <laughs> since I joined this commission, the evidence is outside. 1996 model, Pajero Jeep. <laughs> 1996 model. <laughs> That's the evidence. This your God must be wicked. The God of this commission is a very wicked God. <laughs> he has blessed you with a retired car. <laughs> that the money of maintenance can buy another car. <laughs> very wicked God. <laughs> Since I joined this commission. <laughs> you don't have to join this commission to buy that car. There are people that didn't join this commission that are giving that, they are giving the latest model of that car. <laughs> Glory to God. Those are strange doctrines. Your heart be established with grace and not with rabbina and bread, meat. Be establish your heart in the word. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Be full of the life of God's word. The words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Be full of the spoken word. Let it so fill you up that nothing can survive your environment because you are in charge of it. Don't be established with meat. Be established with grace. Be so full of God. Be so full of his word. Be so full of his knowledge that the devil doesn't even try coming where you are. Because he knows what you will get. Glory to God. Your heart be established with grace. And not with meat. Strange doctrines. Yet in the Old Testament, they ate and drink that communion and they didn't die. They didn't die. In the Passover, they were doing Passover continually. Nobody was dying. Praise the Lord. I say, praise the Lord. Let your heart be established. Put your heart on a firm foundation. Your heart there is not your spirit because your spirit is the spirit of Christ. Your spirit is the spirit of God. But your heart, your emotions, your will, the way you feel is a product of your knowledge. Your will your emotions, the way you feel is a product of your knowledge. And that is the one that needs to be established. So, your knowledge determines your conscience. Now, take note of this. The word conscience is the Greek word sunedesis. S-U-N-E-D-E-S-I-S. Sunedesis. It means a persisting notion. A persisting notion. A thought that stays long in your mind. A thought that stays long in your mind and becomes your conscience. A thought, it stays long. Sunedesis. A persisting notion. For example, when I was growing up, I went to a church where men stayed in one side, women stayed in one side. Even if you're a husband and wife, you don't stay together in church. All men, one side. All women, one side. And there's an aisle, a big one, between this side and this side. So that there's no mistake that a brother and a sister's body will touch. Because the Bible says, don't touch a woman. So we grew up in that kind of church. 
You don't shake a sister. You don't come close to a sister because any contact is a sin. So one day, after prayer, after prayer, a sister that has been liberated ran and just hugged me. I died. I just died. I said, oh Jesus. I confessed that day. Oh father, you know I don't know father, but I'm so sorry. I feel so dirty. Wash me with your blood. Wash me Jesus. What was defiling me was not the hog. What was defiling me was my conscience. A knowledge was given to me and when that knowledge was tampered with, it defiled me. Some of us have a knowledge that says, you know, if you're waking up in the morning and you hit your left leg, it's a bad day. You have believed it long enough. You say, my own God uses signs, signs, signs to talk to me. It's signs. Signs. If I stand up and the, and the, and the, and the cutting goes, fia, fia, it means money is coming. I am full of, Satan will deal with you in this life. The only signs and wonders. So it has become a persisting notion. It has become a belief system. Are we teaching here? Some of us have different belief systems. And these systems cannot be substantiated with God's word. So what do you do? Flush them out. Because they become loopholes that Satan can use to manipulate your life. They become loopholes. Different things. You, 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 you've, been, you've been in it long enough. It has become part of the way you live. You need to check yourself. What are the things that, I, that control me? What are the things that I believe? How can I substantiate them in the word of God? Once you find out that it has no scriptural basis, take it out because it becomes a loophole. Satan can use it. And you don't want to keep anything around you that becomes a loophole for the devil to use. I believe the word of God. It is final authority in my life. I am what the word says I am. Only the word of God should define you. Not circumstances, not situations, not things. Only the word. Say with me, I am defined by the word of God. So a persisting notion. A persisting notion. A lot of teachings. But we have to renew our mind. So that's why the writer of Hebrews will say, have your heart washed from an evil conscience. Amen. And Paul used the word gnosis. It means experiential knowledge. Something that is personal. Something that you have taken time to meditate on it. It has become a part of your life. Take the word of God ponder, ponder, ponder on it until the word of God becomes more real to you than any other belief system you had before now. Take the word of God. Take the word of God, ponder on it. There are some of us, you must dream. No matter how you sleep, you must dream. You believe in dreams. See, my own is dream. And there's no gift of dream in 1 Corinthians 12. But you're always dreaming. Joseph the dreamer. Even if you just do like this, you dream. It's a mindset. Renew your mind. There are things that are superior to dream. Word of knowledge. Word of wisdom. Tongues. Interpretation of tongues. These are supernatural manifestations of God inside you. Those are more reliable things to operate in than just a dream that Satan can manipulate. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Renew your mind. So you can put yourself in an atmosphere of victory where you win all the time. Glory to God. Glory to God. Say, I am justified. I assure my heart. Say it again. I assure my heart. He says, God is greater than our hearts. Please take down this. Sin consciousness is not godliness. Sin consciousness is self-righteousness. Sin consciousness is self-righteousness. A number of things I'm going to share with you tomorrow you don't want to miss. We're going to have some crazy service and we're going to have impartations here tomorrow. Overwhelm your thoughts with the thoughts of God. 
If you're having sin consciousness, it simply means you are deficient in the word of God. You just need to fill up with God's word. A persisting notion is something that stays on your mind long enough. You know, there are some people that are afraid of going to hell, right? They're very afraid because it has become a persisting notion. They even dream and see hellfire. And the kind of hellfire they see cannot even be described from the Bible. It's always fire burning. And people shouting, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no Bible verse for it. But they're always seeing it. Some are always dreaming rapture has happened. You see people fly. <laughs> see, I saw rapture. And that thing they saw has no Bible de 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 backup. Because rapture is not fip, fip. Fip, fip is American movie. So sometimes you watch movie, it defines your experiences. <laughs> because the rapture is not flying. The rapture is resurrection. Mortality, putting on immortality. It's not a disappearing act. So if you are seeing disappearing act and you're calling it rapture, know that you are on your own. <laughs> it's the word of God. Amen. Open your two hands before your face. Say with me, I receive, I receive all things that pertain to life and godliness. They are mine. They are mine. All the resources in Christ Jesus, they are mine. And in the name of Jesus, I declare that the word of God is final authority in my life. And right now, everything that is contrary to the authority of God's word in my life is dissolved, dissolved, dissolved. In the name of Jesus. I didn't hear a powerful amen. If you stand up and shout that amen, it will be better for us this afternoon. Say, I win all the time. Say, I am in authority. Say, the word of God is at work in my life, in my body, in my circumstances. I refuse to accept anything that is contrary to the word of God. And in the name of Jesus, the word of God is at work in me. The word of God is at work in my body. The word of God is at work in my mind. I receive everything that redemption has provided. I didn't hear a powerful amen. Say sickness and disease have no authority over my body. Say failure. failure, I'm a stranger to you. We have no meeting point. I am blessed beyond measure. I am blessed beyond the curse. Whatever I touch works for me. I am blessed, blessed, blessed. I didn't hear a good amen. Are you blessed? I mean, when you sit in the world like this, you just drink and drink and drink and stand up. By the time you get home, things have shifted. You just go like, wow, 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 this thing is, is, is happening so fast. Wow, this thing is happening so fast. Glory to God. Some of you, certain things you've been wearing on for quite a while have just been released. Somebody shout, I receive. They've just been released. Great things are happening around you. Amen. Good things are happening around you. In the name of Jesus. Where your life has been very quiet for a long time, action has just started. Action in the right direction. Good things, good things, good things, good things, good things, good things. God is satisfying your mouth with good things. Glory to God. Glory to God. You know, this conference is not ordinary, right? This conference is for you. Therefore, the blessing of the gospel is upon you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Where things around you can only happen by the miracle hand of God. That miracle is your right. Receive it. I say receive it. I say receive it. In the name of Jesus. Father, thank you that an army of men and women are rising in this united kingdom. Who will manifest your glory, your grace and your power. And we declare this afternoon that everyone that is connected to this service, including those of us that are in the building and those online, 
Grace abound towards every one of you. Amen. You are God sufficient. Amen. I decree that God's word that has come forth to you today will not come back void. Amen. It has accomplished the purpose of God. In the name of Jesus. Needs are met. Desires are granted. There is a working of the spirit on your behalf. In the name of Jesus. Thank you Lord for healing and miracles and testimonies. Thank you Lord for healing and miracles and testimonies. Thank you Lord for healing and miracles and testimonies. We rejoice in the Lord and in the power of his might. Thank you for confirming your word. And thank you for great celebrations happening in our spirit. Thank you for manifestations of your goodness. In Jesus name we pray. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Well, go ahead. Give the Lord some crazy Holy Ghost shout and celebrate, celebrate. Glory to God. Whoa. Glory. Woo. Yeah, 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 yeah. Amen. 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 I tell you, man. <laughs> Amen. Are you blessed? Yes. I'm going to answer a few questions before we close this session. You know, questions that you might have. But I want to take your offerings quickly before we answer the questions. Father, thank you for the privilege to give. We give in faith and we thank you that this conference, great things are being accomplished. Your word is coming to our hearts with such clarity. Everything that was a limitation in our thoughts, in our minds, anything that was a hindrance is totally taken away. Therefore, we rejoice. We rejoice because the fig tree will blossom. We rejoice. We rejoice because things are happening around us. So we give with joy today and we give in celebration. And we thank you that the needs of this conference are met supernaturally. In Jesus' name we pray. Every believer says a powerful amen. Please, you can be seated. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. If you're watching online and you want to give an offering, the banking details are on the screen. You can look at it and send in your offerings too. So you're a part of giving in this conference. Now, I want to answer questions. And you know that question time is also Bible study for us. So, Any questions from anywhere? There's a hand one. Anybody else? I want to see how many hands we have so that I know how many questions we're answering. One, two, three, four, five six okay we have six hands okay so pastor Fola, how do you want us to do it Woo! glory to god all right so the social media missions those of you that are part of the social media missions, go to Croydon page, Power City Croydon. You know, follow now, comment now, share to your own page, share to other people's pages that you have access to. Let's get these teachings to just go viral so more people can be blessed, you know, around the world. Right? Okay. Praise God. Questions? Let's begin. Who is coordinating for us? Okay. So the person coordinating will take the microphones. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. One nine. One nine. Okay. It's one nine. Oh, okay. Yes. He said, but if we say we have no sin. Okay, one eight. Yeah. We deceive ourselves. Yes. And the truth is not finding us. Yes. So most of the time I confess my sins. Yes. So, does it mean it's not biblical? Yes. According to what it's not taught because us? because that verse you read, he wasn't talking to you. Oh. The people he was talking to was not you. Okay. But you forced yourself into that verse. So, the message for somebody became your message. Okay. And misled you. So, who was John talking to? John was talking to two classes of people. He was talking to believers. And he was talking to a group of people called agnostics. The agnostics were people in church who acted like believers but were not believers. So John was now telling those people, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. 
Then if you move to the next verse, he now tells them how to solve their sin problem. If you confess your sin. Now when he says, if you confess your sin, the next thing he puts there is he. So your sin is a he. Your sin is a person. So if you confess this he who is your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So who is this he? Second Corinthians 5.21 tells us that God made him sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. So who are we to confess? We are to confess Christ. Who confesses Christ? A sinner. Why does he confess Christ? To be saved. You are already saved. You don't have to confess Christ because you're already in Christ. So the confessing of sin there is not your wrongdoings. It's a confessing of what Christ has done to free the sinner. Did you get that? There's no confession of sin for a child of God. The believer confesses the work of Christ. Okay? So the next question will be, so if I commit sin, what do I do? Thank you, Father, that I have the gift of forgiveness. My sins are forgiven. Thank you, Lord. If you start saying, Father, forgive me, what you're saying is, Father, you're a liar. You say you are forgiving me, but I don't trust you. So forgive me now. That's unbelief. But because you believe that what Christ did was complete for you. So even when you make mistake, you thank him for what he did for you. Do you understand? The prodigal son, Jesus gave a parable, was eating with pigs. Then he came to his senses and he said, mm, mm -mm, I shouldn't be eating with pigs. Servants in my father's house don't eat with pigs. How can I, a son, be eating with pigs? I will arise and go home. When I get home, I will tell my father, it's even better to be a servant at home because I know I won't eat with pigs than to be abroad eating with pigs. The boy came home. But on his return, the father was waiting for him. So the father ran to him and kissed him. The boy is still following his plan. Father, I have sinned against you. I have sinned against heaven. Before he could say, I'm no more worthy to be called your son. The father said, go, my son is back. Not my prodigal, my son. Because once a son is always a son. The father didn't wait for the boy to confess. The father sent for robe, ring, and shoes. The father dressed the boy and together they walked back home. Because Jesus was showing us that the father's heart is not looking for how to put you away, but looking for how to keep you in that which he has provided for you, irrespective of you. So you don't confess sins, you confess what he has done, you thank him for what he has done. When you are doing that, you are building a realization and a consciousness in you that makes you know that that mistake you made, you are bigger than it. In a short while, you won't make it again because in your inside, your appetite, as you keep speaking what Christ has done, starts changing. Before you know it, you don't even have a need to want to confess anything. And to face facts, sometimes the need to confess things is not because you did something wrong. It's just because you feel that there might be something. And that's what we call sin consciousness. And that's what you have to get rid of and walk in the righteous consciousness of what Christ has done. So, Fill your mind with what Christ has done. It will overwhelm the feeling of a need to confess something. I don't know if it's clear. Moreover, in the Bible, that's the only place you will find that word confessing. You won't see it anywhere again. And in the word of God, you don't build a doctrine out of a single mention. You must have double mention or emphatic mention. And in no way in the Bible do we have anywhere else Everywhere you see confess, it will be confess Christ, confess his name. That's all you'll be seeing. But the only place you see confess sin is 1 John 1, 9. And the reason is because he is telling you to confess Christ. He is faithful. And that's who you confess. Which means it's a salvation prayer. Is it clear? Okay. Bless you. All right.
Hi, um, yeah. I think my question links with that one as well. Okay. Um, regarding, yeah, we know about this, uh, the consciousness of sin, okay. but how would you um, define like godly conviction? Okay, is godly that, conviction. Yeah. Okay. So the consciousness of sin is always condemnation. Godly conviction is always pointing you to who you are. You did something wrong, then the Holy Spirit says, remember who you are. This is who you are. And then the moment he gives you that picture and you look at what you did, you feel stupid for doing it. That's conviction. Condemnation is the devil telling you, look at what you have done. You're not even good. And then you start saying, oh, Father, I know I'm not a good person. Just manage me. That's condemnation. The Spirit of God does not condemn. He convicts. Convict means he points you back to who you are in Christ. That's what the Bible calls godly sorrow. Godly sorrow simply means he will show you who you are and you will feel bad for acting below who you are. And then the next thing you want to do is retain who you are in spite of what just happened. So you maintain your confession of who you are. I don't know if you understand. So that's how that happens. All right. Next question. Thank you so much, Dr. Damina. So I, I had a question. Um, thank you for teaching today. Um, as we've taught already, our sins have been purged, forgiven, we're sanctified. But I'd just like to be thorough. Um, sure, and sure. reading the book of 2 Corinthians um, chapter 7, verse 1, it talks about, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness and flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And I wanted to understand how all of that fits together, what it means in the context of the larger discourse in 2 Corinthians 7. Okay, Thank so you. if you observe the church in Corinth was a church that was given to all kinds of sinful acts. So Paul is addressing a church of carnal lifestyle. So, but he first of all begins by saying to them, he says to them, you, come, you do not come behind in any gifts of the spirit. He tells them, you were once like these people, but you are washed, you are cleansed, you are sanctified. You are purified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he already establishes this is who you are. Then he begins to deal with the issues one by one. He says to them, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, because you are babes. First of all, there's division among you. Okay, so he deals with division. And how does he deal with division? He says, some of you say you are for Apollo, some of you say you are for this, for that. He says, but remember, I am your father. Though you have 10,000 babysitters, yet I am your father. So he brings all of them from all the multiple influences and brings them to their loyalty to his teaching ministry. So he takes care of that. Then he moves to the brother who took his father's wife. He said, I hear that there's a brother who took his father's wife. Okay, he said, fornication is being committed among you. And it's not even the kind of fornication that is mentioned among unbelievers. This one is a peculiar one. How that a man took his father's wife. And none of you see anything wrong with that. Then Paul said, but before I come to that church, I'm going to judge ahead of time. That brother who has done this sinful act, okay? He says, let that brother be handed over to Satan. Now the word Satan there is the word Satanas. Satanas means let him be handed over to condemnation. That is, don't defend him when brothers start talking against his behavior. Allow him to be exposed to the criticism so that he will know something is wrong with him. Okay? So he says, deal with that person like that. And then he says, if he still doesn't make adjustments, okay, he says, don't eat with him. Give him some distance. Then after a while, he says, receive him back so that godly sorrow will not kill him. So he's still our brother, but, you know, it's like, discipline him, but keep him. Love him, but let him know something is wrong. Okay? Then he goes on from issue to issue in that church. But you can see the spirit in which he's bringing the correction is to point them back to who they are. Point them back to who they are. So that cleansing is still has to do with pointing them back. This is who you are. You are not this. This is who you are. So again, what we call holiness or sanctification is pointing the believer back to his realities in Christ, which comes through teaching. Constant teaching. Is it clear? Bless you. Next question. 
Yeah, so firstly, thank you for everything. Bless you. Uh, I've learned a lot today. Uh, so I have two questions. My first one is, what does it mean that Christ became the son of God after he died? That's the first one. Okay. Let me, if you can please expand on that. And the second one is, what, does, what do you understand by um, saved by grace through faith? What is that? Or, or whatever. Okay, what saved by grace through faith. Okay, so what do we mean by Christ became the son of God in his resurrection? It's an identification theology. Identification theology simply means we sinned, but we didn't have what it takes to free us from sin. And the wages of sin is death. So we should die. But God loves us. And God's plan is to live with us forever. So if he allows us to die because we have sinned, his plan will be defeated. And we will be punished. And there will be no proof that he loves us. So in his love, he becomes a man. Because as God, if he comes to the earth, nobody can kill God. And since the payment for sin is death, he has to come in a form where he can die. So he removed divinity and put on humanity and came into the earth. Okay, grew up. And because of what he preached, Satan moved in people, not knowing that he is the Christ, and killed him. And in his death, he identified with us. We were already dead. So he died to identify. So instead of we dying completely away from God, he dies in our place. He is separated from himself. God is separated from God. That's on the cross. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou? So a separation has taken place, just like we were separated from God. So he identifies in our separation. He dies. Three days, three nights of separation, which represented eternity the whole of eternity without God. On the third day, he rose. When he rose from the dead, in that resurrection, he rises as a son of God because he is about to give birth to a family of sons. So he himself will have to be a son to produce sons. Now, son doesn't mean child. Jesus being the son of God means an amalgamation of divinity with humanity. Deity in a man. So God in a man. When you receive the gospel by grace. Now grace means that which you don't qualify for. Freely given to you. Faith means that which you also didn't work for. Freely given to you by the gospel. Faith comes by hearing. So when you hear the message, it produces in you faith where you believe in what Christ has done. So when you believe in it, the grace is what Christ did, which you never qualified for. So the grace is his work. And then the gospel gives you faith to believe what he has done. Then you now are born into the kingdom as a son of God. Your sins are forgiven. From that moment, you are now in union with God because Jesus was separated on your behalf so that you can be united. You become one with God. Does that settle that for you? Bless you. Praise God. Question? Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. So my question, uh, it's in two parts. Okay. Uh, I've learned the revelation about uh, consciousness uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Okay. So you touched on fasting, on some of the, I don't know, how people does fasting and yeah. which is not correct. Yes. So I wanted to know how... how you can do correct fasting. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then the second one, you mentioned about manifestation of four manifestations. One of it is uh, tongues. So I wanted to, to, to also understand the correct way of praying. Uh, quoting Jude 1, 20, which says, build up your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Yes, yes. Okay, so let me deal with the first one. The first one is um, for fasting. So in the New Testament, there's no teaching on fasting at all. You won't find anywhere where you are taught to fast. From Acts to Revelation. There's no even instruction. There's no. But you will hear Paul say something like, in fastings often. That means Paul was fasting often. 
But you want to find out why was he fasting often? Because he found himself in trials and persecutions where there was no food. He had to fast. That's why it was often. I don't know if you get that. Okay. So, should a child of God fast? In Acts chapter 13, the Bible says, they were fasting and praying. And the Holy Ghost said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas. So, which means in the early church, believers fasted. Paul fasted. Okay. Jesus fasted. So, what is it about fasting? Some people will quote for you, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. But actually, that's not true. What you have in that scripture is, you couldn't cast out demons because of your unbelief. Simple. So this kind of your unbelief does not go out, but by prayer and fasting. It's not the demons, it's your own unbelief. Demons, you don't need prayer and fasting to cast them out. You just need the name of Jesus in my name. <laughs> but unbelief. So now, so what does fasting do? That's the first thing we want to ask. What, what is fasting for? Fasting is a self-help. Self-help. Fasting does not produce power. Fasting does not give you an advantage with God. God doesn't even know you're fasting. In fact, fasting doesn't even have anything it achieves where God is concerned. But fasting helps you. Whenever you find that you're getting distracted, you're getting too busy, you're no more focusing. Even when you want to pray, your mind is crazy all over the place. So that time you need some discipline. So you stay away from food or anything that has become an object of distraction. See, most of us think fasting has to be food. No. Your phone needs to be fasted. Sometimes, just take your phone, lock it up for two days, and die if you have to die. For those two days. When you die, you wake up. After the two days, you wake up and carry the food. That kind of fasting is also important so that you can pray, you can think, you can fast. Sometimes it's television. Sometimes it could be friends. You need to fast them off. Just say, hey guys, I'm not going to see you guys for one week. I'm having some things engaging me. So you cut off from their influences so you can take stock and look at what influence are they even having over you. So you know whether you really need that kind of friendship or not, or you need to minimize. All of that is part of fasting. Okay, so it doesn't have to be food. And let me also mention something here because it's very important. It's not every time you fast and do what they call dry fast. Sometimes dry fasting is unnecessary torture to your body. Because as you are in that dry fast, you can't even pray. All your body is like, yeah, 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 yeah. And you are busy looking at the clock. It's one o'clock. Oh, Father, when will four hours be over? My target is five o'clock. Oh, when? And then after a while, you say, please put the pot on fire. Make sure the food is ready. You are no more fasting. You can as well just go and eat. Because you're out. You're out of it. You're no more in it. Okay. So, fasting doesn't have to be food. If you observe what they call the Daniel fast, even the people that teach the Daniel fast, I don't know whether they are not reading. Because the three weeks of Daniel fasting, he was eating. He ate food very well for three weeks. It's just that he said what he was eating was not pleasant. Which means he might have been eating food without meat, without salt, just bland food or something. So he fasted away the sweetness, fasted away some things from the food. But he ate for the three weeks. It wasn't dry. He said, I ate no pleasant bread. Okay? Now, there's another dimension of fasting. Religious people don't like this one. But fasting is fasting. In the morning when you wake up, that food you eat in the morning, what is it called? Breakfast. What is breakfast? Breaking You're breaking a fast. So that means you fasted in the night. So that means you fast every day, whether you know it or not. So you can as well turn that fast into a proper fast. What makes it a proper fast? Bible study and prayer. 
So you can fast at night, pray for a few hours, study the word, listen to God, and in the morning you break it and go through the day properly and do your business well. Not that you're going through your work, you're fasting and you're angry. So I said, don't talk to me like that. Don't you know I'm fasting? Who sent you? <laughs> so you can fast at night when you're not interacting with people, pray, study, speak to the Lord and break it in the morning and go through the day empowered, eat well and treat people nice and do your business well. And at night again, you can miss your dinner and fast right into the morning and break it and eat your breakfast. And that's a powerful fast. Did you get that? Uh -huh. So it, fasting is just staying away from food for a spiritual exercise. Is that clear? And it only helps you so you can gain traction in your commitment. Finish. Clear? Okay. Then the next question you asked was, I'm trying to remember now. Tongues. Ephesians 6, 18. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Before we go to Jude. Ephesians, part of the whole armor of God that you put on. Ephesians 6, 18. He says, praying always, always, with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. So every prayer you pray as a child of God will be in tongues. All, always in the spirit. And when you are praying in the spirit, you are watching thereon with all perseverance and you are supplicating in the spirit for all sins. So your prayers, 90% should be in tongues. Only 10% should be in English for the benefit of those around. Otherwise, if you're praying alone, or Paul said, I speak in tongues more than all of you put together. A church of 25,000 people. Paul said, my own tongues are more than all of your own put together. That means everything Paul prayed was in tongues. No wonder he could write more books than anybody. Why? 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 2. 1 Corinthians Chapter 14, verse number 2. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. How be it in the spirit? So when you speak in tongues, why are you speaking? In the spirit. So how do you pray in the spirit? In tongues. Always. Is that clear? Always. And let me tell you something else. Whenever you pray in tongues, the moment you start praying, you already know what you're praying. Except you're not taught. Tongues are not rocket science. Everyone who speaks in tongues should be able to interpret it. It's as easy as ABC. It's just simple teaching. Anyone who speaks in tongues should be able to interpret it. I interpret my tongues. Almost always. Except I don't want to interpret them. And I also interpret people's tongues who speak around me. Because it's one spirit. Once you start speaking, I can almost tell what you're talking about. But that's because I'm developed. Okay? So you can develop and you start from where you are and begin to grow in it. As you speak, expect to understand. If you speak, you don't understand. Say, Lord, I want to understand what I'm saying right now. Let him that pray in tongues pray also that he may interpret. So you pray and you say, thank you, Lord. And you stop. You check. And in your understanding, as you're speaking, what first comes to your understanding is exactly what you're speaking in tongues. You're not thinking about it and it just came, bam, in your mind. That's what you're dealing with in tongues. Do you understand? Yeah. So that's what you do. You pray all the time in tongues. I have a full teaching on it. If you go on YouTube, uh, it's called Baptism of the Holy Spirit, Tongues and Interpretation of Tongues. It's about part one to four of tongues and interpretation. And I dealt with tongues holistically, beginning from the Tower of Babel, where languages began. So I traveled through history, and I came to zero in on the doctrine of tongues. It will bless you. It's tongues 
an interpretation of tongues. And I dealt with all the myths and all the arguments from different schools of thoughts against tongues. I debunked them with scripture and I dealt with them squarely. Tongues and interpretation of tongues. Is that clear? Bless you. Next question. Thank you very much for today. Um, I wanted to ask, how do you attribute a loving God with like acts of like Noah and destroying the world and stuff like that? Because whenever you try and explain a loving God, people always ask that question, oh, but your God wiped out the earth, your God did this, your God did that. How do you kind of attribute the two and marry the two together? Okay, so the loving nature of God is such that he loves you so much that he allows you the freedom to choose what you want. But in that choice, there's destruction. So he warns you of what will destroy because he loves you. And he shows you what will be safe for you. And he allows you to make the choice. Because he loves you. Love does not insist on its own. Love will allow you to have your way after it tries to help you. So that's why God forces nobody. But of course, he allows you also to know that there are consequences. Life, death, blessing, cursing, choice is yours. Adam, don't eat of that tree. There's death in it. But eat of this one. If not, the day you eat it, you shall die. He didn't say, I will kill you. That means there's a self-destruct button in it. Don't go there. He's just a loving father. So Adam goes in and says, I don't want life, I want death. God won't stop him. So Adam goes against the law of life and he dies. And God still comes, Adam, where are thou? That's a loving father. He doesn't abandon him. Where are thou? Have you done what I say you shouldn't do? The woman you gave me, excuses, excuses. Then God says, the solution, the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. That's the solution for that problem that man created. That's love. He goes all the way with you to help you out if you will allow him. Sodom and Gomorrah was a type of the end of the world. A type. The Old Testament is types and shadows. It's called typology. A communication that shows you God's plan and what happens when God's plan is rejected. So Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot, they kept preaching the gospel. The people will not hear the gospel. And then the time of destruction comes, which is a type of the end of the world. And the angels come in to take Lot out. And then the Sodomites come, and they want to sleep with the angels. And the angels are still preaching to them, but they wouldn't listen. So they strike them with blindness. They take Lot out. And the moment Lot leaves, who is a type of God... It begins to rain fire. So the absence of God will be destruction. God can't stay forever when you don't want him. A time will have to come. He will leave you alone to your choice. That's Sodom and Gomorrah. The world of Noah is the same. Noah preaches for 120 years and nobody will listen to him. And then the time expires. Noah now will get into the ark and the door will be closed, and the flood will come. And all those who rejected the ark will die. Just like anybody who doesn't believe in Jesus, when the end of this world comes, he will have to be with Satan, whom he has chosen to be with, and Satan will destroy. Do you understand? So it is still love that God will allow that those who don't want him can go and have a separate accommodation without him. Did you get that? Uh -huh. So it's still his love. So Sodom and Gomorrah was a type of the end of the world. Noah, that's why Jesus will now say, like it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Meaning Noah's day was used as a typology to teach what will happen if people reject the salvation plan of God. Is it clear? So it's a, it's a form of communication. It's types and shadows. Bless you. Question? I have some questions here. Okay. My question will indirectly be related to the last question. Okay. Um, when we say God is in control, 
what do we exactly mean? That's a very pregnant statement. So that's why we don't say it carelessly. We must explain what we mean because God is in control even though God is not in control. That question is what we call the sovereignty of God because it has to do with God being sovereign. But the sovereignty of God can only be explained within the framework of salvation. You can't explain it as a general. No. He's only in control of his salvation plan for man. But he's not in control of everything. The moment you say God is in control of everything, it means then God is the one behind sin. God is the one behind every evil because he's in control anyway. But he's not. He has put the control of your life in your hand. And he has told you, look, you are a free moral agent. Life, death, blessing, causing, choice, yours. But what has to do with salvation? He's the captain of salvation. He dies. He makes salvation available. And when you receive him, he comes in to occupy you and secure you. He's in control of salvation. But he's not in control of everything. So he gives man some level of independence. But this independence is not without consequences. So you have freedom. But the freedom has responsibility. And if you don't handle it well, that same freedom will destroy you. But he loves you. So even in the destruction, he still makes a way of escape. If you will cooperate, he will still rescue you out. But if you say no, no, he will let you have your way. So that control has to be explained within the framework of salvation. I have a full teaching on it. The four I wills. I will read you out. I will deliver you. I will restore you. I will. Those four I wills in Exodus expresses the sovereignty of God. I did a full teaching on it. I think it is the sovereignty of God. It's Soteria season four. So if you go on YouTube, and you type Soteria season 4. is a full teaching on the sovereignty of God. Where I dealt with predestination, foreknowledge, election. That the doctrine of election. Who did God elect? Does God know who will be saved and who will not be saved? All of that. Okay. So that's where I dealt with the sovereignty of God. In Soteria 4. Is it clear? Bless you. Bless you. Next question. Thank you. Um, my question is, um, I've come from a traditional background and coming into um, the grace message, I want to understand how, what is the role of the Holy Spirit um, in, the, in, this, in this grace message? Because I, I heard that you have to sort of like, you know, the Holy Spirit has to be in you, has to guide you, has to, um, you have to hear him. And it's like, you know, I don't see that. So I want to understand how does that happen? How do we get that? So now I know where you're coming from. You must have come from a place where there's a lot of emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Yes. Which is another gospel. Because the moment you isolate the Holy Spirit and begin to emphasize him independent of Christ, you have created a gospel that is not the Bible. Because the Holy Spirit is here to glorify Jesus. He's not here to glorify himself and create a niche for himself. No. All he's here to do is to point to Christ. Do you understand? Mm. Now, in that community where you're coming from, because I know the whole thing there, they teach you that the Old Testament is the dispensation of God the Father. The four Gospels are the dispensation of Jesus. Today, is the dispensation of the Holy Ghost. So you pray to the Holy Ghost. You talk to the Holy Ghost. Anything you need is Holy Ghost. That's another gospel, which is not another. It's a perversion. Do we believe in the Holy Spirit? 100%. Who is the Holy Spirit? Is the Spirit of Jesus. Who is Jesus? The revelation of the Father. Okay. So three of them, one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. So, what does the Holy Spirit do? He glorifies Jesus. How does he glorify Jesus? 
through the scriptures. He's in you to bear witness to the truth. So when the truth is preached, your head may not understand it, but inside you something will witness. That's the truth. Thank you. And Jesus said when he is come, he will guide you into all the truth. How did he guide you into all the truth? The epistles from Romans, all of that is what we call the pneuma aletia, the spirit of truth. The teachings that came that rightly divided the Old Testament. So those teachings called the epistles are actually the guidance of the Holy Spirit into all the truth. So all the truth about God are contained in the epistles. So do we have a personal, do we need to establish a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit? Once you have a relationship with Jesus, you automatically have a relationship with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Jesus. He's called the spirit of his son and is already inside you. Do you understand? So his work is not to reveal himself to you. His work is to point you to Christ, the Christ of the scriptures. So you see how many hours we spent teaching the Bible? Everything we did here now was the operation of the Holy Spirit. Because everything was to reveal to you Christ, what Christ has done, and the part you have in what Christ has done. We don't have to now start saying, oh, Holy Spirit. Holy. No, we don't need that. That's another gospel. That's not the gospel of Christ. Do you understand? Yes. yes. Is it clear? It is. Then another one is, um, there's a lot of emphasis on the powers of darkness. And, and, you know, a lot of time that sort of like weakens me. And, you know, the churches, a lot of, you know, some of these yep. churches, that's their major yep. teaching. And so at times it's like when you're not in that side, you're not, you don't, it's like when you're not um, praying their prayers, yep. it's like you're an you're, alien. You're, 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 you're not, you're yep. ready to get delivered. Yes. So at times I get confused a lot of times because yes. it's like, oh, you're playing with your life or you're not ready at all yes. to, you know, deliver yourself. Yes. So can you just explain to me, you know, this teaching? Because it's very confusing because that's like, you know, I'm Yoruba and that's like their major teaching. It's called seducing spirits. So those churches, you're going into a place where there are seducing spirits. And the mission is to seduce you away from Christ. That's why you're weak. Because they're taking you away from your source of strength. Those teachings are all doctrines of devils. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. So those teachings are to take you away from the faith. Some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Are you born again? Why do you need deliverance? What does it mean to be born again? So if you're born again, then why do they have to remove demons from you? You see these things, you see these things manifest. You actually see this pattern. You see it. So the pattern is there because they gave you a doctrine. And that doctrine brought into your midst a manifestation of seducing spirits. Is the teaching that makes you manifest. If I want to make people manifest here, and I know what to say. <laughs> I used to do it. I know it. It's not that they told me I was a master in it. There are things I will say that will make you open up to seducing spirits. And within a few minutes now, people will just be screaming all over this place. But you know the problem. They are the same people that scream all the time. Do you get the point? In Jesus' services, people are not screaming all the time. Because whom the son says free is free. 
you can be free and you are bound and free and bound and free and bound. It means you are hearing something that is not right. Don't be carried away by the manifestation. Me, I can create the manifestation. I can create it. Because they create it. It's easy. It's just to attack you with fear. Give you stories. Tell you things that scare you. And you now open up. Then the spirit of what they are saying comes in and begins to manipulate people. And people start falling and screaming. It's easy. I know exactly what I'm talking about. Do you understand? Do you understand? It's very easy. Sometimes you hear them, they will say, there are 15 ladies here. The power of God is going to come on you. You cannot stand. You cannot stand. 15 of you. The power of God will come on you. That marriage you've been waiting for. As the power comes, your life partner will show up. Now you've been psyched because you want marriage very badly. And they've told you that you cannot stand. So they've conditioned your mind to fall. They've created the atmosphere and you're hearing it. And they're saying you cannot stand. The power is coming now. The power is coming now. You want it. So, <laughs> then the spirit takes over and you see them falling all over the place. I was there. I know this thing. There are 10 of you businessmen. Your business has been going like this. The power is coming. The power, ushers. Oh, hey, 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 ushers. Hold him. Hold him. Hold him. Yeah, boom, boom, boom. Hey. So, it's doctrine of devils. And it opens the door to seducing spirits. There is nothing about Satan to teach neither give place to the devil. We don't give him place in teaching. So I can't come and be talking about demons, Satan, the different stratas, their manifest. Once I start doing that, I just created room for Satan to enter and take over the place. And there will be manifestations of Satan. Whatever I teach will manifest. If I teach Christ, he will manifest. If I teach healing, it will manifest. If I teach demons, they will manifest. So those churches... My sincere advice, stay away from them. Because if you don't stay, you will be a victim for life. They will just keep wasting your time. After a while, you will find out that you cannot be able to serve God's purpose. So every year is like ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Two steps forward, 30 backward. One forward, 15 backward. Never make. Then you see people that you got saved with. They are also doing exploits, but you can't because you've been robbed. You've been denied your realities in Christ. Is it clear? Yeah. Next question. Hi. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I have three questions to okay. ask. Um, firstly, um, emphasis was always laid on Israel from okay. the beginning, it was okay. always if, uh, before Jesus came. So I want to ask, what then happens to other nations okay. of the earth that never heard the gospel? Uh, the gospel? Okay. That's number one. And then we understand that um, it's not the character of God to kill. Yeah. But we look at how Israel, the fame of Israel spread all over the world was like they were destroyed lives and property. Yeah. Everywhere, even when they got into Cana. Yeah. So how do we explain that? And most of the time, it was always instructions from the prophet. You go into the land, toss here, the Lord, destroy the Amalekite, the Jebusite, all of them. And the third question is, uh, we um, read a scripture two days back about um, by one man sin. Enter the, uh, the word. So uh, does that, so does the sin of Adam automatically make all men sinners? Or by choice. Okay. So the first question there is the nation of Israel, right? The nation of Israel. So Jesus couldn't have just appeared in every country. Because he's just one person and he came as a man. So he has to come through a particular place. He couldn't come through America, UK, Europe, Israel. He will be four different human beings. He has to come as a full person. So, Israel was chosen by God to be a type of the nation that will be used to communicate 
the new creation. Okay? So, Jesus came through Israel. Israel. In the Old Testament, Israel played a, a part of a type. But the moment Christ came, Israel lost their place in that plan. It's over. Today, there's no Israel, no Gentile. There's only a new kind of humanity. Because the coming of Christ was the climax of what Israel was used for to, to point to God's plan for his new nation, the nation of the new creation. I did a teaching on it, I think. It's called Paul's Israel. I think in Christ's reality season two or three, three, right? Three last year. It's on YouTube. You can get all that on Paul's Israel. And I dealt with all the whole Israel, Israel theology and where it terminates and where its relevance ended so that nobody keeps making Israel too important. They are no more important today. They are no more important in the scheme of things because today there's a new nation. And that nation is not Jew, it's not Gentile. It's a new creation in Christ. Is that clear? Now, why then did the nation of Israel in the Old Testament become so powerful that they were used to go to wars and all that and win all the wars? Since they were used in the Old Testament as a type, now, those wars were like spiritual warfare. Those physical wars are like the spiritual warfare we're fighting today, where we engage and disarm and overthrow and get people saved. Their own was physical. Our own is spiritual. Their weapons were physical. Our own is spiritual because their own was a typology. Our own is the real deal. So that's the way to look at it. But then the issues, all those wars and things have to be explained within their own different merits. You can't have a blanket explanation for all of them because all of them have different explanations. That will take us another four years to do from today. It's a lot of teaching. But if you go on YouTube and check my teaching on the misunderstood God, part one, two, three, and four, I dealt with all the killings, the disasters, and all those things exegetically from the word of God. You will find a lot of answers in the misunderstood God series. Is it clear? All right. Any other questions? I think I finished all. Okay. Scene of Adam. So was the sin of Adam automatic? That's a serious theological question you just asked, which requires many hours of exegesis. I did a full teaching on that, and that is Soteria, season 10. Soteria 10. We dealt with the doctrine of sin last year. Okay, so the sin of Adam is not automatic because for the sin of Adam to be automatic will make God unjust. I did nothing wrong. One guy that I don't know, I never met, just did something wrong, and I'm being punished. It doesn't make sense. So that's why the Bible will say in that Romans 5.12, if you watch the language, Brother Paul is too intelligent. If you watch his language, his choice of words, look at that Romans 5.12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Watch the language. And so death passed. Death passed. It was not automatic. It was passing from one person to another. It will come to you with the message. If you reject the message, you die. If you accept the message, you escape death. And it kept going like that from one person to another. That's why the word passed is using that text. But further explanation will be verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. So there are those that did not commit Adam's sin. Which means Adam's sin is not automatic. So question, who are those that did not commit Adam's sin? Abel. Abel, in the house of Adam, as a son of Adam, did not commit the sin of Adam. Because by faith, Abel believed. Even though his father didn't believe. 
And if there will have been a beneficiary of Adam's sin, the first beneficiaries will have been his children. But Adam, I mean, Abel was not a sinner. Hebrews 11, by faith, Abel. So Abel did not sin Adam's sin. But Cain sinned Adam's sin. So in the same house, his son escaped it. So which means it's not automatic. It passed. So till today, children that are born are born innocent. No child is born a sinner, even if his parents are native doctors. <laughs> even if the parents are idol worshippers, the moment they get pregnant, that baby in their womb is innocent. He's not a sinner. He comes out innocent. Okay? Then he grows to the age of accountability, where he now knows good and bad. Then the gospel is given. He rejects, he's a sinner. He accepts, he's righteous. So that's why when children die, who have not reached the age of accountability, all children on earth who died, who did not get to the age of making a choice, they're all with Jesus. Even if their parents were Muslims, they're all with Jesus. Suffer the little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of God. So there is justice. I mean, there's compassion with justice. Just like in your society, children are not taken to court because they are still underage. Okay? And they are not convicted for crimes because they are still babies. So there's compassion with justice. So that's the way it is with God. So all babies and children who died at time of childbirth while they were babies and kids, all of them on earth are with Jesus. But once they get to the age of accountability, they now have to make a choice whether to be saved or to be lost. And if they are lost, the gospel keeps coming. It only becomes too late when they die or if the trumpet sounds. Is it clear? But the full exigencies on that Soteria season 10. It's on YouTube for free. But I think it's about 40 hours or something. But you'll enjoy it. Next question. Yeah. Um, I have a question regarding the word of God. So you said the word of God a few times. Is it the Bible or is it a person? And the second question is, could you explain more about the... Um, the progressive revelation of God in the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi. Okay. So, when we just say the word of God, we're talking about the Bible. But when we get into the technicalities of the word of God, then the Bible is not the word of God. Because the Bible is paper and ink. The word of God is a person. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, not by it. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the word is a person. But in the context of Bible teaching, since the Bible also contains God's word, we call it the word of God. And we teach from it. But technically, Jesus is the word of God. Is it clear? Yeah. The next question was what? Progressive revelation. Good. So in the Old Testament, because they were outward people, the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit, neither can he know them. They were not born again. So God could not reveal himself to them in full because they can't handle it. So God was unveiling himself to them in bits and pieces, enough for them to believe the gospel. Bits and pieces. So that's why you will hear some of them will come and say Yahweh. Some will say Adonai. Some will say Shama. Some will say Nisi. Some will say Jairi. Those are literally two segments of the revelation of God. And it kept progressively coming out gradually through the scriptures. And then in the four gospels, all of that revelation came together and took up a body and the word became flesh. So Jesus is the totality of all those little, little snippets of revelation in a person. 
So in Christ, we have the complete revelation that was progressively coming through the Old Testament. So today, because we have the Spirit of God and we are born again, we can now receive the full revelation of God in Christ. Is it clear? So when you read the Old Testament, you will see a lot of stuff, a lot of mixtures, and that's why it has to be studied. It has to be explained. In the Old Testament, you will see things like God kill it, God make it alive. God created the darkness. He created the light. You see things like, can, can a city be destroyed and God has not caused it? You see things like that. The Lord has given. The Lord has taken away. You see a combination of the revelation plus people's impressions plus people's misconceptions all combined together and communicated. So the teacher of the word will have to break it down, open it up, explain it, and rightly divide it. So that within that junkyard, you can still see the revelation of God clearly communicated. I don't know if it's clear. Bless you. Next question. Are you learning something? Yes, yeah. Thank you. Um, sort of following on from his question just now. Yes. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 um, I just wanted to know how we rightly divide the word of God, of God okay. for instruction in righteousness specifically. Um, so that's my first question. And okay. my second question is um, baptism. Okay. Um, what about baptism? Yeah, okay. water baptism. Um, I don't know what to say specifically about it, but what are your thoughts? You want about to understand it? what the Bible teaches? Yes, yes. On water baptism? Yes. Okay. Thank so, you. How do we rightly divide the word of God? So what you're driving me into right now is what we call principles of Bible teaching, Bible interpretation. Now that's a whole course that you will learn for the rest of your life. <laughs> I'm still learning it myself. You keep learning. Okay, so, but there are principles. You learn them, you know, um, there are principles. I teach them a lot. You know, all my books are Bible interpretation. Everything I teach is Bible interpretation because all I do is take the Bible, allow the Bible interpret itself, and from there you see the message. So what are those principles? Those are the things you need to know. There are a number of them. For example, there's what we call the law of a first mention. The law of first mention says anywhere you see a word first appears in the Bible, it carries with it the original flavor of that word. Then there's a, the, the law of double mention, which says you don't build Bible doctrine on a single mention in scripture. It has to have a corroboration. Okay. Then there's emphatic mention. Emphatic mention means when you read the Bible and one chapter emphasizes one same issue over five, six, seven, eight verses, that's emphatic mention. So then you have the rule of pretext, the rule of post-text, which are, unveils context. So the Bible is a contextual material that when you read, you must apply the rules of literature. Okay? You must know that in the Bible there are metaphors, figures of speech, there are hyperbole, there are parables, you know, and all of that. And you must expect to see all of that when you read. You look out for them. So that's it. You know, part of it, I mean, that's just a bit of it. But there's a whole lot more. I think I have a full teaching on how to study the Bible. If you grab hold of that, I think it's on YouTube. It will give you a lot more of how to study the Bible. But like I said, it's a lifetime thing because, again, it's not just enough to know how to study all those rules I gave you. You've got to also go beyond that to begin to realize that the Bible was not written in English because English was not in existence when the Bible was written. And even till today, English is still young because vocabulary is still developing. But Greek and Hebrew were the languages that was in existence. They are far, far older than English and they have verbiage enough verbiage that English doesn't have what it takes to translate those. So in the translation of the Bible, because of limitation of verbiage, so many things were not properly interpreted. So as English is developing, more and more we have verbiage in English that will interpret those things better. 
So that's why when I do that, they say I'm trying to rewrite the Bible. I'm not actually trying. I'm just using the advantage of robust vocabulary available today to look at when King James interpreted the Bible. That's why I have things like, verily, verily, I say unto you, which is no more in use in our communication today. Things like hitato, whithersoever, things like that, okay. The, the, thou, 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 thou knowest, you know, I chemist, and things like that, <laughs> you know. So, so, but today we have more vocabulary. So that's why again you have King James and you have New King James. If you read the New King James, more updated English is used in translating the New King James. But even that is not enough. Because again, there's more verbiage today that gives you better explanation than them. For example, like I always use the illustration of love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For God so loved the world. So he tells you not to love, but he's loving. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. A friend of the world is an enemy of God. Then he says, go into all the world and preach. How can I preach to people I'm not their friends? So it gives you a, a feeling of a contradiction. But it's verbiage. It's because language, vocabulary was not enough. So when you go back to the Greek, now you find out that there are two words in the Greek for world. There's a word called world in the Greek called cosmos. There's another one called aeons. Cosmos is a cosmopolitan where human beings are. Aeons is a way of thinking. So for God so loves the cosmos, love not the aeons. See? So it's not a contradiction. It's just for the explanation when vocabulary is available. Uh -huh. so most of the seeming contradictions in the Bible it exists only in the mind of a man because he doesn't have the full expressions for it so again that's why we do what we call Bible interpretation so in Bible teaching that's why sometimes you will hear me I will say this is not correct it shouldn't be like this this is what it should have been and religious people get angry with that they just feel like when were you born you are editing the Bible <laughs> it's not edited but if you come across theologians Theologians, people that went to proper theological schools, they appreciate what I'm doing very well because they understand what I'm doing. But illiterates and the idiotes, they say he's editing the Bible because they don't even know anything to start with. Uh -huh, so, do you understand? Uh -huh. And they forget that it's people like me that sat down to interpret it for them to read. <laughs> it wasn't the Holy Spirit that interpreted, it's human beings. I have a book, free, free, free of charge. It's called Eternal Salvation. You can download it. You know, if, if you meet Pastor T, she will give you the link quickly after this session. You can download it. The first two chapters is how to interpret the Bible. The first two chapters, Bible study. It will give you some of these tips. And then if you have my book, I think they may have it in the book stand. It's called Causes and Myths. I mean, Causes, Myth and the Truth. It has introductions into proper Bible interpretation with a lot of stuff there in that book. Bless you. Next. Water baptism. So what about water baptism? Matthew, I mean John chapter 1. Pay attention. John 1 29 so that we can just clear that. That shouldn't be rocket science at all. That should just be easy Bible reading. The next day John said Jesus coming unto him and said behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Next verse. This is he of whom I said. This is John, the father of baptism. Talking about what really made him baptize people. This is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man, which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not. And I knew him not. And I knew him not. But that he should be made manifest to Israel, Therefore, am I come baptizing with water. So the purpose for water baptism was to reveal Christ. Next verse. And John bore record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. Next verse. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the spirit descending and remaining on him. The same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. He will not use water. He will use the Holy Ghost. I will use water to identify him. Once I identify him, 
water expires, he will now take over and baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So water baptism is not for us. It's for Jesus. So that's why water baptism is swimming exercise. I did like three water baptisms because they used to tell me that that is how I prove I'm saved. <laughs> uh, it has no spiritual relevance. It expired with John the Baptist. And I always ask people who are proponents of water baptism, who baptized John? So if John was not baptized, it means the baptizer himself <laughs> does not believe in the baptism. <laughs> now watch, watch, watch. <laughs> Watch what he will say here. Next verse. Okay. And I saw and bore record that he's the son of God. So now watch. So there's water baptism and there's baptism of the spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse 4 and 5. Acts of the apostles chapter 1 verse 4 and 5. That's the beginning of the New Testament church. Acts of the apostles chapter 1 verse 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. Verse 5. Watch. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not with water. Water was for me. Now I have come. You will have Holy Ghost. One more scripture. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. Next verse. One Lord, one faith. So if there is water and spirit, that's how many? Two. Which one will you want? Water or spirit? So once you have spirit, you don't need water. Because baptism is supposed to be one. And that baptism of the spirit is what you receive when you are born again. You are born of the spirit. So you don't need river. It's no more relevant. Somebody say, no, the reason why you go to the river is to identify with Jesus publicly. Which public is there? <laughs> How many publics are there? It's just you and the group of people and the pastor and one or two people. So how did the public know you were baptized? Do you understand? That argument is lame. It's totally lame. And there's no scripture that says you should. And then again, another problem they have is they have not even explained the word baptism. Baptism is the word baptizo. Baptizo means to be immersed. And it doesn't have to be water. I can baptize you with soup. I can baptize you with money. I can take a bundle of pounds and just pour it on you. You say, hey, the man just baptized me with money. So, baptism doesn't have to be water. So, when you hear the Bible says, baptize, you have to look at the context to know what's saying. For example, the teaching of John is called the baptism of John, but it's a teaching. The answer. So, again, context. But where water is concerned, water expired once Jesus was identified. Yes. Again, in the book of Acts, is historical account, eyewitness. What Dr. Luke saw, okay, he wrote. He was just accounting as to what happened when the church moved from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And he showed how they transitioned. So you will see water baptism to a point and then it ends. You won't see it again. Because at this time they have grown to know that water baptism is useless. Peter will be killing Ananias with the prayer of fall and die. But after a while, nobody is killing anybody again. They are growing. So you will see their baby steps. You will see their transition. You will see where they retired those things and where they became matured. So that's the book of Acts. Do you understand? And after that, you won't see water baptism anymore. Because it's not a New Testament stuff. Is it clear? All right. Next question. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Papa. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, I just wanted to ask a question around salvation. Salvation. And this is to people who have mental capacity in terms of their cognitive and things like that. Because okay. I walk among them. Okay. And I just want to know what's going to happen to them um, okay. in terms of salvation. Okay, so like we're talking about deaf, dumb, we're talking about mentally retarded. All right? Deaf, dumb, mentally retarded. So that means they are incapable of making a decision. Okay? So again, the same thing that will happen to children will happen to them. Because there's compassion with justice. They'll be treated like children. Just like children cannot make a decision, they too cannot make a decision. So they're in the same class. So when they die, they go to Jesus. Whether they believe the gospel or not. Because they're incapable of making a decision. Deaf and dumb, same. But the deaf, there's a way of communicating the gospel to them. And the dumb, there's a way of communicating the gospel to them also. So that's why those people who do communication with the deaf and the dumb are critical in the preaching of the gospel. Because a deaf person can believe the gospel, receive the gospel, and be saved and preach it. And they'll preach it in the way they communicate. Do you understand? Yeah, so I'm even planning to make sure that in 30 days of glory we have somebody with sign language communicating the things I'm teaching so that all such people in different parts of the world who follow our services, because a lot of them follow, will understand more clearly what we're teaching. So yeah, that's what happens. There's compassion with justice. Once they can make a decision, God's mercy covers them. Is it clear? Yeah. Um, who else? Yeah. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. You. Ray. God bless you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask an advice, if okay. that's okay. Sure. There is a lady friend of mine, and her father abused her when she was young. From a young age through to about 28, this had been going on, and he was a man of God. So she seemed to believe that that was the right way to go about in life. Now, it's not the case anymore. However, she goes around teaching the word of God, but is unable to shake the weight of the trauma that happened to her. She's unable to shed it off. So I'm glad that you're talking about consciousness, sin consciousness, and I've sent the link to her. So I'm looking for an advice for her in moving forward in her full potential of ministry. Thank you. Okay, so I, I think what she will need is, hmm, she will need to be properly discipled. Properly discipled. That's somebody who will take her through a lot of Bible teaching, and who are accountable for it. There's a way you get so overwhelmed with God's word, it erases all the records of the past. So it's just to expose her to serious bombardment of sound Bible teaching. It will saturate her system and remove all that memory. She will not even remember that such a thing happened. You understand what I mean? So that's what she needs. She needs to be exposed to a lot of teaching. You know. So if, if you can connect her to uh, my YouTube channel. She can just stay there all day, all night. Yes. Once you introduce her and she starts, don't worry, she'll be addicted. There's something about sound Bible teaching. You become addicted. Once you start, you can't stop. Uh -huh. So, and once she gets addicted and she starts spending five hours, seven hours a day, eight hours a day, in a few, few months, weeks from now, you, 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 you're on telling you, I don't even remember such a thing happening. It will remove all that record. It's called the renewing of the mind. Yeah. That's what to do. Bless you. Bless you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Papa. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I want to say thank you. Uh, yesterday, I think there's more clarity to me now on uh, we only know what is right, but what God says is right. That's right. And uh, this is about the legality legality of our justification. This yes. is really, and as you were revealing this, I came to a lot of cobwebs have already gone out uh, in the sense that, that the legality of our justification is predicated by, by God and uh, upon the sinner. And it, it, I was relating to 
I'm from Nigeria. Yes. I was born in Nigeria. They normally say to me where I am that I say, I'm, in, I'm in Nigeria. I'm born in Nigeria, but I'm not in Nigeria because I'm a new creature in Christ. That's right. Hallelujah. That's right. They all know me for that. That's right. Hallelujah. So, so the, the light that actually came to me was the president of Nigeria. Yes. He didn't win, but he was justified by the law. Yes. That whether we like it or not, you have to accept it. We have to accept it. Despite all the baggages, you know, so it has actually made me to come to this point of accepting it. You have because to. up to now, I wasn't accepting it. No, you have to. So you can't. Yeah, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. From the legality of my justification now, right. that I'm a sinner, right. guilty. Right. And the Lord found a way right. through legal, the law. A legal way. A legal way. Right. To justify me. Full time. And now with boldness I can stand. 100%. And said I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Of God. So with that now, it has given me that boldness and I've come to the terms of accepting that president. You have to. I, you know, <laughs> hallelujah. You have so to. So thank you, Papa. Thank you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Bless you. You have to. <laughs> On perfect legal grounds. You know, the law is so, such a wonderful thing. You see a clear case and they will tell you for technical reasons, this matter is a bad matter. But you have all the evidences. But they just take, there's a technicality of the constitution that doesn't support this. And that's it. And they strike it out. No emotions. When it comes to legal issues, there are no emotions. So the same thing with the Bible. We are not emotional. If God says you are free, you are free. Whether you feel it or not. No emotions. So, you know, no sentiments. Religion makes you sentimental. But sound Bible teaching, no sentiments. Right is right, wrong is wrong. It's like that. So, we're justified. Irrespective of how we feel or how we don't feel, we're the righteousness of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Are we blessed? Yeah. Pastor Fola. Papa, I've got a um, few questions online. Okay. Um, please, Papa, if someone asks me, since God is omnipresent, how is he absent? And if one rejects God, and is his, or is his own? Is if God, I mean, is God that is everywhere, not in hell? I am only asking for clarity, not because I doubt what you have taught. The presence of God can be in a place and it is not there. The presence of God can be in a place and at the same time it is not there. Like God is everywhere, but not everybody knows God is everywhere. So they cannot benefit from his being everywhere. So even if he's in hell, the people in hell cannot benefit. benefit. He's not there for their benefit. He's there because that's how he is. For them to benefit, they will have to believe it. And they have already rejected it. And the door is closed. Grace has expired, so they can't believe anymore. Is it clear? Yes. He's yes. there, but he's not there. Okay. And fire can't burn him because he's above all things. all things. So he can be in a place and nobody knows he's there. That's why David would say, if I make my bed in hell, you are there. Ah. Okay. So it's not like God will not, will not be everywhere including hell and everywhere. But he's not going to be a part of a part of suffering. He's just going to be there by the reason of the fact that he is God and is everywhere. They will be actively involved. And the reason is because he is not there, even though he's there. Like God is not in everybody's life, even though he's there. But he's there, but he's not there. And they can feel his absence. Even though he's there. God is the creator of everybody. 
Of course, he's the creator of everybody, but he's not the father of everybody. He becomes your father when you accept his plan to have a relationship. But he created everybody and everything. Yes. Next question. During evangelism, we have a question on how God loves, does not stop wars like Russia and COVID and disasters and sickness, etc. How can we answer that, please? Wars and COVID are activities amongst men. They are activities amongst men. Russia stands up with a big hand and gives Ukraine poor. You don't need God inside. So Ukraine too looks at Russia and say, take. And America and others come to say, bring your hand to Ukraine. And they put their hand and say, give it to Russia. Pua. And Russia goes, papa. God can't be in it. God is not in it. So they will have to find a way someday and solve their issues. This is men. God has no hand in it. See, it's not everything that God is involved. Otherwise, he becomes a busybody. So he's not involved in that. Uh, Israel and Palestine, God is not involved. It's their fight. It's their fight. It's just that people that are not taught the Bible well think that God is with Israel. But actually, there are more Christians in Palestine than in Israel. So if there's anywhere God is, it's the Palestinians. Now, I'm not anti-Israel or pro-Israel or anti-Palestine or pro-Palestine. God loves the world. I love the world. I want all of them saved, both Israel and Palestine. And I don't want anyone to win. There should even be a reason to win. Everybody should be able to live and serve God and know God. And then, but of course, you know, that cannot happen because the spirit of this world is always looking for how to oppress. So, so you have what you call the world powers. They want to remain world powers. And they are fighting now for supremacy with China, America, Russia, and all that. All that is human greed. And you can never stop it. So that greed is what is going to create wahala everywhere. And nobody can stop it. It's just what happens amongst men. The best we can do is preach in the midst of it. And pray for the peace. We pray as much as possible that God will create circumstances that will avert disasters and stop some of these things. And as we pray, some people will be kicked out of the way. Some new governments will come that will have influence to stop the war. Do you understand what I'm saying? Prayer will do all of that. But God will not just go in and say, you come out, you go in. Then the moment he does that, he has broken his word by interfering with the will of men. So again, it has to go through the process. Is it clear? Yeah. And the last one, the gospel, epistles, and revelation all emphasis that all things were created by God and for him and for his good pleasure. Can we then say demons and the devil were created by God to disturb us for his good pleasure? <laughs> That's some dangerous hermeneutics. That is serious Bible interpretation. God didn't create demons. God didn't create Satan. God didn't create Satan. God didn't create demons. God didn't create evil spirits. God didn't create any of those. So where did they come from? God created angels and gave them the freedom to choose. And among those angels, Lucifer who is Satan, decided he doesn't want to be an angel anymore. He wants to be an angel of darkness. And he began to be jealous of Adam's position. It wasn't God Lucifer wanted to be like. He can't even think of it now. Have you ever molded clay and the clay wants to be like you? <laughs> God created, Satan is a creation of God as an angel. But now he rebelled. And in that rebellion, Adam also rebelled. So Adam rebelled, Satan rebelled, and in their rebellion, they swapped position and there was a twist. Man fell, Satan rose. 
So man created Satan. Man created sin. Man gave room to demons. That's why when Jesus defeated them, he still brought them under man. He still put them under us because we are supposed to be in charge. So when he says God has created all things for his pleasure, he's talking about things, 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 moon, stars, mountains, trees, things, things, things. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, all of that. But not demons and all of that. And even the things that afflict our bodies, like mosquitoes that give us malaria back in Africa. I know in London you don't have malaria. But in Africa we have malaria. And we have medicines for it. You don't even need a doctor. Once it hits you, you go and buy and take it. <laughs> clean it out. <laughs> and if you're going abroad, you must carry a pack in case. Because if it hits you, you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> so it's my daughter Jael who said daddy why did God create mosquito to give us malaria I said no they were not created to give us malaria all these animals that have become detrimental to man started being detrimental after the fall it was not so from the beginning so from the fall of Adam a number of things went out of place the world is no more the way it used to be Things started changing from the fall of Adam. But things changed more drastically from the flood of Noah. From the flood of Noah. Because the flood of Noah wiped out everything and then God came up with a new program. As long as the earth remained, seed time, harvest, summer, winter. It was not so in the beginning. In the beginning, rain was not supposed to fall. Mm -mm. Water wasn't supposed to be falling from the sky. Because there was mist in the ground that was springing up and watering the ground. And there were clouds in the sky that conditioned the sky to make the atmosphere cool for man. Things were perfect. But the fall of man scattered everything. And then the first rainfall was judgment, which is the flood. After the flood, the man will have to depend on water from the sky because things have gone out of place. So God in his mercy allowed for rain to be falling so we can still have food to eat. But that was not the plan. But everything went out of place. So from after the fall of man, a lot of things changed. And things are changing as the days are going by because the planet is becoming old. So you start having earthquakes. You start having disasters. You start having all kinds of stuff because this planet is aging. The Bible tells us that this planet is aging because this planet is on a lease. It's not supposed to be here forever. It's on a lease. And as the lease is expiring, things are falling apart more and more. You will see more natural disasters. Not because God is wicked, but because man is not able to maintain the planet. Man is breaking all the rules that make the planet function. Man is wearing out the planet, so things are growing old. That's why if you observe, during the lockdown, a lot of things changed. Even in the atmosphere, a lot of because all the pollution went into, into suspension. Yeah, all the things that we do and all the chemicals and things that we have invented, all these things went into, you know, into suspension. And we could have fresh air and everything was looking cool and cool. The moment the lockdown was over and the madness started, it's like things are progressing more and more so. But God in his mercy has ensured that this planet lease will not expire. We will be out of here. Somehow, somehow. We will be out of here before the lease expires. So that's why we keep preaching. Because God's long suffering will not be forever. It will just be for a long time so that we can preach. Amen? Amen. So things have changed. If you want more, you can get to YouTube. Check my teaching on why things happen the way they happen on the earth. I have part one, part two, part three. And I'm looking for time to do part four. I already have part four ready. Amen. All right, is there anything else, Pastor Fola? One question. Okay, one. Okay. Praise God. Yep. Thank you so much, Papa. Thank you. I can't thank you enough. You know, I just wish you were my lecturer in, in the seminary, you know, but thank God for all the things we were taught. Yeah. We've applied them. Yeah. 
we were not, they were not applied to us. Yeah. And um, I just have two questions. Uh, this one is, I mean, there is no day you open Facebook, YouTube, you see your videos uh, being put side by side with other pastors. It's bloggers. Bloggers. <clears throat> and they are using me them. to make money. And they are not paying tight. They are not paying <laughs> If I say it again, it will be on social media. <laughs> he said, you see him, he said he has attacking tight. Now he's asking for tight. <laughs> I, this guy's just like me, man. I can't even rest. But it's okay. At least the word of God is advancing. More and more people are hearing. Paul said, whether it's by strife or whichever way, the important thing is that Christ is preached. So it's cool. Yeah. So, for their sake, I want to ask this question because there is this teaching even among the Christocentric uh, community yeah. that um, as a young Christian coming up, being taught that if you speak against the teachings, errors of fathers, that you may not, you may struggle or m never uh, function in certain capacity of grace. So... <laughs> so I wanted you to say something concerning that. Uh, All right. So this is just one. Maybe I should. Okay. Ask yes. I'll just say one. The second one is from uh, uh, Second Timothy three fifteen. Okay. Uh, because um, we've been taught that um, you should not only take what is explained, but how it is explained. Yes. So um, talking about um, holy scriptures, um, areas grammar. Yeah, and the past graphy. Um, I like the, the analogy that you always use. Now, all scripture is talking about, you, you said it's talking about um, documentation. Yep. The inspiration is on the documentation. Yes, past graphy. Yes, and you use the example. The art like, of writing. The art of writing. So, like, um, you use this example, like, if a governor tells me, someone to go and write concerning a thing, okay, maybe, like, he needed to travel, yep. and immediately came out of the airplane, he started yep. writing. Yep. So then you said the event was not inspired by God. Yep. But that documentation was inspired. Was inspired. Yes. So my question is, the choice of words in that documentation is was it inspired? Was not inspired. In, okay. Because the choice of word is your words. It's your word, yeah. And the way you write it is dependent on your mental cap capacity. Yes. Sir. For example, if I can't speak um, English very well, and I can only speak Hausa, a Nigerian language, and then I am inspired to prophesy. I will prophesy in Hausa. Because that's what my mental capability can put together. No matter how God moves me, I can never prophesy in English because it's not inside me. So the choice of language is man's. The vocabulary is man's. The communication is man's. That's why you will see the way James wrote his book. If you are not careful, you can begin to preach legalism from James. He called all of us sinners, but we're believers. He said, oh, ye sinners. It's his way of talking. So you have to understand. And then you see that Peter, who should have written the New Testament, only wrote one book that they split into two for respect. First and second Peter. <laughs> But you see Paul. See Paul. Kabayada. 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 See the thing flowing like water. <laughs> so education is critical. That's why I say to people who are in school who say, ah, the fire is burning. I want to leave school and do ministry. Part of ministry is the school. If you don't go to school well, you'll be limited in communicating the gospel. And God will not wait for you. He will raise another person that can communicate better than you to complete the one you cannot reach. So, but you can make yourself an all-rounder and, and be well-equipped so God can use you without limits because you are developed. So going to school is critical. Being exposed is critical. Understanding, you know, all of that is critical in equipping you to do ministry effectively. So preparation time is not wasted time. So again, the choice of language is man's. The communication is man's. So that's why sometimes what man said has to be interpreted to be able to get what God is saying. 
So that's why Bible interpretation takes care of all that. Uh -huh. To arrive at the understanding of what we're really saying. And sometimes if the interpretation looks, it doesn't look too good, then you go broad. You leave that immediate environment and open it further. If it still doesn't give you what you're looking for, you look at the entire book. And in the light of the whole book, you can zero in what this man is trying to say that will not contradict the general message. So again, all that is involved. There's language, there's culture, there's worldview, and all of that involved, you know, that the people had when the Bible was written. It's clear? The first question you asked was fathers. The question now would be who are the fathers? Because we need to define who the fathers are. All this one they are talking of fathers, fathers, fathers. Who are fathers by the Bible? A father is not somebody that is 80 years old. That's a natural father. That's not a spiritual father. And when we're talking about gospel fathers, we're talking about spiritual fathers. So the question is, who is a spiritual father? A spiritual father is somebody that is responsible for your doctrinal persuasion. Somebody who didn't teach me doctrine is not my father. From where? The DNA of fatherhood is doctrine. Paul didn't get Timothy born again. But Paul was the one that molded Timothy doctrinally. So Paul said, Timothy, you are my son because I have begotten you in the gospel. How? Doctrine. So who are these fathers? We can't just be catching fathers in the sky. Fathers are people that are responsible for your doctrinal persuasion. For example, I can't call these people my father because they didn't teach me anything. I know who my father is. They can intimidate others, but not me. Because I'll tell them the truth to their face. I respect your age as a human being, but that's where it ends. When it comes to Bible, move, shift. I know who I should listen to. Okay? So when these people commit doctrinal blunders, we don't touch their persons. We take the blunder. We bring it under the, under the scrutiny of scripture and we correct it. That's not disrespect. That is actually loyalty to Christ. That you cannot be alive and Christ who died for you, somebody is attacking what he said and you keep quiet. You are not, you are not loyal. I won't attack you. I won't, I won't call you names. I won't even call your name. Mm -mm. But I will take that thing you said and I will bring it to the cleaners and I will open it up and dissect it because if I don't, somebody who ought to be saved that may only hear you may never be saved. So our loyalty is to Christ ultimately. So all these ones are talking about fathers, 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 fathers. I keep telling them who are even the fathers. We are the fathers now. Me. Me. Some of the people they are calling fathers are my boys. They are my boys. I'm their father. Whether they recognize me or not. And no matter how successful you are, your father can never be your friend or your age mate. I'm their father. I can tell their history. I can tell their formation. I can give details. So when you're talking about fathers, I just look at them. Because who are the fathers? Where are the fathers? Something I've done for about 40 years. If I'm in the army, I'll be a general with five stars. Me. Maybe I will have done a coup and overthrown the government and I will have been a president somewhere. Because me, I don't trust myself in those matters. I want to collect power, if not for the gospel. And I will rule for like 40 years. You can't overthrow my government. Till I am very old, then I will hand over to you. After all, that's what others are doing. <laughs> Don't mind me, I'm just joking. I know, you know. But the point I'm simply making is, even all of you here have that responsibility. Because if you don't, your children will be taught a God that you never knew. We all have that responsibility. 
It's not just Abel Damina. We all have it. All this shout I'm shouting. You know, I keep telling people that. It, there's nothing personal I'm looking to gain in all this fight that's going on. Because first of all, I'm not fighting to collect money. If I was collecting money, they would say it's for my pocket. This is just to make sure that the gospel is well kept, the truth is preserved, because Christ died for it, and he saved me. And I owe him my loyalty. And I will not fold my hands and watch somebody make caricature of the holy wreath. I have a loyalty to Jesus in my lifetime to make sure if anybody misquotes the Bible, I put the record straight. I'm telling you. And all of us have that responsibility. If you go on YouTube and look for my teaching on apologetics, introduction to apologetics, part one, part two, part three, by the time you finish hearing my teaching on apologetics, you will be worse than me. I promise you. You will now see the reason why you must not allow somebody speak contrary to the truth of the gospel and keep quiet. A false Christ will produce false converts. And if we love people because we love God, we must do everything to make sure the truth is presented respectfully. We insult nobody, but we deal with issues. Amen. Amen. Somebody says, if you don't pay tight, you will not make heaven. We are now. For God so loved the world that he gave his only tight, that whosoever tight shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's fraud. That's false. That's false. Somebody said, if you don't give money, God will not bless you. Where? So again, we have to stand up. Bible says, contend earnestly. Content. That word content is, content is a combative word. To contend, to defend the truth of the gospel. If some people had contended before, we wouldn't have been in the mess we entered. Because some of us here are still coming out of that whole rubbish. See, and if we don't stand up, our children will not go to church because they are asking questions which we never asked. I'll just tell you, it doesn't add up. I'm not interested, I don't want to come. What's it? I'm not coming. Is it by force? And you can do nothing about it. So, we have to make sure the truth is preached. And don't forget, the Spirit of God will not bear witness to lies, He will only bear witness to the truth. So, if we want the Holy Ghost to really get people in the kingdom, we must defend the truth respectfully without attacking persons. Is it clear? Yes, so that's, that's the position. But if you go on, just check my teaching on the introduction to apologetics. Part one, two, and three. The second one is actually apologetics and consecration. The third one is apologetics in a hostile world. So intro apologetics, apologetics and consecration, apologetics in a hostile world. If you check on YouTube and it's not there, it should be there. But if it's not there, if you ask, they can give you the links. But that teaching will bless you a lot. Praise the Lord. Are we excited? Tomorrow is going to be... Yeah, 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 yeah. Woto, woto at another level. We're going to have great times of fellowship. Invite as many people as you can. Get everybody that wants to hear some good Christ-centered message to be here tomorrow. We're going to have a great time. Pastor Fall, our service is 10 o'clock. Okay, 10 o'clock tomorrow. We're all here, and we're just tabernacle. Good to see Pastor Kufre from Southampton. We love you, man. And it's just beautiful to have you here today. Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, Pastor Fola, is there anything else? Yes. And again, it's important for me to announce that we have campuses in the UK here. A number of campuses. Our campuses are actually the branches of our church. But we don't call them branches. We call them campuses. The reason why we call them campuses is because we want you to have a mindset that you're coming to learn. Because the whole thing about church is learning. If you read the, the book of Acts, it says, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in prayer and in breaking of bread, which is love feast. That's, that's what church is. Teaching, fellowship with one another, prayer, and love. Finish. And that's what we do. And our services are not too long. And if you live anywhere, you don't have a sound Bible church to attend. You can join our campuses. And the plan is, we, we don't intend to just keep you 
warming the seats. Once you join our campus, we set you up for training. Within a few months, you're already a pastor. You start another one. Because we want to shine the light everywhere. We want everybody to have the opportunity to do ministry. So if you join a campus, training starts. We start preparing you to do the work of ministry. Because at the end of the day, when you leave this world and you see Jesus, you'll not be rewarded for working in Barclays. You'll not be rewarded for working in any of the banks or any office. You'll only be rewarded for the number of souls you brought to the kingdom. And if you're not winning souls, you're not building people, you'll just be in heaven smiling and watching us while we're collecting our rewards. And brother Paul say you will suffer loss. When they tell you you will suffer loss in eternity, it is loss. So you don't want to wait because it's ministry on your life. You need to be equipped. You need to be empowered. You need to be trained so you can serve the purpose of God. You know, so I want to encourage you. We have campuses and we have discipleship trainings that go on both in the campuses and online. There's even one running right now where we take you through discipleship basics. I answer all your questions. I'm with you in class on Zoom. I teach, I answer questions. I teach, I answer questions. And we take you through a number of weeks. And by the time we're through, you have a lot of understanding. Then we move you on to the next session. It's all trading training. And we're glad to do it. You know, for anyone who wants to be trained and helped. Like I said, there are a number of campuses. And it's important you join one if you don't have a sound church where you go and you're trained. Don't float. Don't be without a church. And don't be an online member. Because online is not enough. You need the fellowship. You need accountability. You need to be among the brethren. You need that kind of atmosphere. So I want to encourage you. you know, and if you want further details, I think we have forms at the... Uh, the, the number of forms out there. Just fill up one form and we will quickly reach out to you with no delays. But, you know, we love every one of you. And I'm just excited to be here. You know, just looking at your faces, I just feel anointed. You know. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Tomorrow, 10 o'clock. Pastor Fuller, anything else? I think basically. Yeah, Sister Kate, where is Sister?